This episode of Breakfast Punks podcast is dedicated to the memory of Calvin Sewell. Calvin was the singer for the band Grand Collapse and was an awesome human being and one of the best singers and lyricists to ever come out of the DIY punk scene. Um, so this one's for him. says caffeine's a drug. I said, oh, tell your friend, fuck you. I don't want to be your buddy, but just want a little breakfast. Welcome to Breakfast Punks, a podcast about weird shit, DIY punk and trashy movies. Brought to you by Sham City Roasters and Deadbeat Donuts. From Hastings, I'm Siobhan. And I'm Dave. And this is episode 33, where we're going to be talking about the Hopeless Record sampler, Hopelessly Devoted to You. 
and reviewing the film Vegas in Space from 1991. We'll start with a song from Corrupt Vision, and the song is called Failure to Thrive. They're from California. We've played them before. I think it was on our first ever episode. It was our first ever episode. First ever episode. This song is from These Hands of Mine, which is out now via Toxic What's It, and they are going to be playing in Hastings on the 23rd of April at The Pig with Rash Decision, Brazen Hussy, Dinosaur Skull and Comeback Clip. And they're touring the UK with Rash Decisions, so go check them wherever you live. So this is Corrupt Vision with Failure to Thrive. Is some Breakfast Punks podcast news. <laughs> How much you all enjoy that? Just to gloat about ourselves for a second. Uh, we've got a couple of really exciting things coming up. Um, at Manchester Punk Festival on Friday, the 15th of April, we're going to be doing a live podcast. Yeah, before any of the bands officially kick off, yeah. which is fucking weird. So, no excuse but to come. Oh, I mean, uh, it's up to you. <laughs> it's on at 2 30 at the Sandbar. And uh, after us, immediately after us, is going to be an episode of the Seabin podcast. Yeah. We haven't quite worked out what we're going to do. I'm guessing that possibly we will... Chat shit. Yeah. <laughs> but come and see us. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, um, sorry, that sounded... <laughs> yes, mean... please do. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Siobhan keeps talking about including audience participation in this, and I keep assuring her that there will be no audience. <laughs> <laughs> so prove me wrong. And come to the sandbar at 2.30 and listen to us to chat some shit. And a little bit sooner than that, uh, we are going to be co-hosting an episode of the FBPR podcast. FBPR stands for Football, Beer and Punk Rock. I would say I know about one of those things. (laughs) I'm quite good at one of those things. And I know nothing about the other thing. Can you guess what? which is which? You're quite good at... Punk rock? No, incorrect. I know, but I, I, don't, I wanted to be polite. You're very good at beer. I wouldn't say you're very good at beer, actually. I've only drunk once since January. It's so pretty bad at beer, then. I'll be shit at beer now. Yeah. I think that's, that's um, unquestionable. You know about punk rock? And you tell me that you used to play football as a child. I, I mean, I was in the I was the centre forward of the Cubs team. <laughs> I don't know if that counts, really. My dad was the manager. <laughs> Oh so dear. I don't think I've ever claimed to know or have any interest in football. Name a modern football player. I won't know if you're right. Oh, I bought my nephew a book by... But he's probably retired, though. Oh, I, bought, I know who it's by. Go. Uh, so I bought a book for my nephew about a football player called Marcus. Yeah, what's his last name? I don't know. And he <laughs> may be... He looks like a child on the front cover of the book, but he's probably a retired footballer who's like... <laughs> no, I think he's about 21, 22. Oh, OK, so he he's is young. a current footballer. Yeah. Um... You Marcus, just Marcus the football player. Rashford. 
Okay. Even I know that because he did uh, he did uh, dinners for the for the youngins when the Tories can be asked. Oh, the book seemed really nice yeah. for a child. Yeah. It seemed like it was going to be a nice thing to to give someone. Anyway, I know nothing about football. So they're going to really enjoy Absolute us co-hosting nothing, their nothing podcast about football. And f- I've listened to a number of episodes of their they podcast. They really do know stuff. It's about wonderful, football. and you should all check it out anyway. But they really do go into some deep cuts when it comes to football like specifically about the scottish league which yeah. i mean i know nothing about <laughs> football full stop but i'll tell you what i know even less about scottish football so the perfect co host yeah we're saying. gonna be brilliant apologies in advance uh, <laughs> lovely fbpr we uh, will do our best yes and thank you so much the episode will be out on april the first uh, so it will probably be out whilst you're listening to this yeah. so once you've finished listening to this entire episode Mm -hmm. all the way till the very last please do always then flick over on your wireless to the (laughs) fbpr podcast uh it will be episode 13 and they're going to be interviewing mikey erg yay so check that out do so well from wonderful positive news to this story man stabbed girlfriend in the bum because they couldn't agree where to buy pizza. <laughs> um, this is brief. I can completely understand. Uh, yeah, that. I was just like, I think I resonate with this, and I'm going to get stabbed soon. I think a judge told you a man, are definitely going to be doing the stabbing. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. If one of us is going to stab the other one over pizza, it is definitely you. Oh, <laughs> I, you've got me wrong. You've got me wrong. A judge told a man it would almost be funny if it wasn't so serious. And here, here's me bringing it up because it's quite funny. <laughs> As he jailed him for stabbing his girlfriend in a row over pizza. Nathaniel Williams, 29, got into an argument with his girlfriend about where to buy their food. He wanted Pizza Hut. She wanted Pizza Choice. At some point, she went in the kitchen to get a drink. And when she turned her back, she uh, felt a small prick in her backside. Mm. That's what it says here. Um, but then she felt blood in her hand. And when she turned around, he became hysterical saying, sorry, sorry, sorry. She uh, was convinced by him not to go to the police until she told her friend, and her friend was like, you fucking lunatic, your boyfriend stabbed you in the bum. Go to the police. And uh, he's been arrested and he can't get near her now. It's a very strange action to stab someone in the bum, if you're yeah. upset with them. Yeah, like, I'm not suggesting he should have done anything worse. No. Or, or being playful about <laughs> domestic violence. But well, stabbing yeah. somebody in the bum does seem like a very unusual choice. It's very odd. Do you it's think he odd. aimed somewhere else and just got her in the bum? I mean... I don't know. I don't know what people think when they pick up a knife. If they go, God, there's a knife in my hand now. What the fuck do I do with this? Oh, the bum. No, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a stabber. I wouldn't know. How many times in your psychiatric career have you been threatened with a knife? Not many, because we don't really carry knives on the wards. Oh, I've been no. lucky. I have I've been, been threatened with... Sorry, I've been threatened with an injection I accidentally allowed a patient to get near. Well, that's a terrible nurse. It was course. awful. <laughs> I turned my back. It was all bad. Uh, it was quite recent as well. I turned my back. You meant to have two people in there when you give an injection. Uh, it was just me. I was like, oh, I've done this loads of times. Short and staff in NHS needs more nerves. Shut the door and I'd accidentally left the injection on the table. The patient ran over. When I turned my back, he was like, you want this? And he was holding the unsheathed needle in my face. <laughs> and I was like oh god I'm going to get a pixel depot in the eye this is shit That's... and then I just screamed in my big voice uh, put, in put big it down voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah I screamed put it down voice. but, like but it came out because I was fucking terrified <laughs> put it down this man is like 150 kilos like he would have fucking <laughs> I thought I was getting in the eye and then I had to give him an injection. I should have called someone else in. Didn't. He swore at me the entire time. Yeah. He nice. apologised to me later. <laughs> and then called me a cunt and then carried on to threaten me. It was fine. So, yeah, no. Uh, that's the only time I've been threatened with anything sharp. I think I've been attacked with a knife three times. Ooh. And a hammer once. <laughs> so, let's move on. Yeah, let's move on. So, yeah, sorry. This, uh, I thought it was funny. I don't know if it is funny. A judge said I shouldn't laugh, so I shouldn't have laughed, but I laughed. Carry on. Ah, oh, that judge sounds like he's no fun. I'm... I mean, oh, the poor woman got stabbed in the bottom. That's true. I suppose the judge, the judge was doing his job. Yeah. Well, my first news story is about new metal beef. What? There is new <laughs> some new metal beef. There is no. Oh, as in, sorry, I thought it was a brand metalers. of like burgers no, that it's... someone from the new metal scene has decided to do. No, some new metalers have beef. There's nothing like fat middle-aged men with arm tights getting disgruntled with each other. And here is two. <laughs> Limp Biscuit have been slammed by Snot for taking rapper Snot on tour with them as one of their support acts. What? So the old new metal band Snot, who were really like also rans. Don't know if anyone would remember Snot. They had one album was out in the sort of late nineties. What did you call them? Snot. Yeah. What did you say they were? Also rans. 
What was that? <laughs> well, and also Ran is someone who was kind of alongside someone else who was successful, but they didn't make it themselves. Uh, okay. And Snot definitely didn't make it themselves. Never but they're grumpy one. because Fred Durst has decided to take a rapper with the same name as them out on tour. And oh. I'm not going to lie, I saw the poster of this Limp Bizkit tour and I thought, oh my God, a Snot still going? Uh, but it wasn't Snot at all, it was Snot. Uh, it was Snot, Snot. Oh, there we go, you see. So Snot guitarist Mikey Doling... Has he's gone on the record? Limp Biscuit just posted dates for a new tour, and they are taking this rapper kid named Snot on tour with them. I wanted to say to Fred Durst, if you see this video, which he's clearly not going to, because it's <laughs> just some crazy man in his fucking mum's basement. You came on stage with us and performed. Lynn went on stage with you in Boston, and you know the incident I'm talking about. I don't know what incident that could possibly be. It's between them. It's between them, David. We were friends. We share drinks, stage, music, all that. And all these years later, you take an artist named Snot on tour with you. What the fuck is that, man? Bullshit. What the fuck is that, man? Bullshit. So, yeah, he had to address it. That's what he says. Compelled. That's my two cents. And so that fake Snot kid... And then he gave him the middle finger. (gasps) Brother, there's only one fucking Snot. Get some. (laughs) I'm pretty sure Said 50-year-old Bobby in the basement. (laughs) Poor old Mickey. Mickey, sorry. Anyway, Snot, the rapper Snot. And by the way, he is slightly different because Snot's S is a dollar. Oh, well, it's completely different. Snot replied with a simple sentence. This is like classic 50-year-old man versus young, intelligent boy. Yeah. This is actually ridiculous. Old man mad about my name. That's all yeah. he said. <laughs> He's just been like, who are you? <laughs> Durst is yet to comment. He doesn't give a fuck. We talked a little bit about Limp Bizkit on our extra Patreon episode. We did. Which has just come out. And um, I was just horrified to find that Limp Bizkit seemed to be really big now <laughs> for some reason. Yeah, it's a bit disturbing. It's a bit disturbing how I feel like that scene is... Is back with a passion, including the fashion as well. I mean, you mentioned arm tights. Oh, tell me about it. I mean, it. arm tights are back. And those baggy trousers that weigh so much uh, material get muddy on the back. I think we've talked about this before. <laughs> anyway, Limbiscuit are taking Wargasm, who I think are from the UK, Snot, with a dollar sign Snot, somebody called Young Gravy, which I quite Young like. Young Gravy. And Dying Wish, and a band I really like. And this is why, this is why this came to my attention. This hardcore band called Scowl are... Supporting oh, yeah. Limp Bizkit on all of these dates. Well, not all of them, I don't think, but it just seems weird. It seems weird that a hardcore punk band would be sharing a stage with Limp Bizkit yeah. in any world, to me. Maybe I'm entirely wrong. I don't know. We're not down with the youngins. We'll see that later when we talk about Hopeless Records. Well, but ironically, I'm not down with the snots either. I'm down so, with the snots. I don't know. I'm, I'm on the side of the young person in this story. <laughs> well, the star of my next story is not a young man at all. Mm-hmm. Chinese man has lived in an airport for 14 years. Do you know why he's lived there? Is he influenced by that Tom Hanks movie where Uh, he lives in an airport? He's not, although that is made reference to in this article. I'm sure it is. The reason that he lives in in the airport is so he can get away from his family and smoke and drink as much as he wants. (laughs) It's like leaving Las Vegas, but really slow. (laughs) Well, basically, he left his house because his family said he needed to quit drinking and smoking, and he said, fuck that, and now he lives in the waiting area of Beijing Capital International Airport. (laughs) And he's lived there for 14 years. He's loving it. So he said he won't return home because then he'll be forced to quit drinking and smoking uh, because his family will want his government allowance. And his government allowance doesn't afford the family as well. He said, if I want to drink and smoke, I'm I'm moving to the airport. That's brilliant. Yeah, he's having a great time. And what do you reckon the airport think? I'm surprised he hasn't been turfed out. No, they quite like him. I mean, he doesn't leave the airport because he won't get cold if he stays in the airport. He's gone from Terminal 2 to Terminal 3 and back again. Terminal 3 is a bit chilly. Um, and he buys all his food off of them, so they quite like him. Oh, he's probably good for business. Yeah, they said um, he is harmless, albeit a loud drunk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't bother the other passengers. Uh, he doesn't freeze. He has a happy time. Every now and then we've mentioned that he does lose his temper when he's drunk, but he, he reacts to us quite well, so we don't mind. They love him. They don't have a problem with him. He's does he not have time. to go anywhere to get his government check? I don't know. I don't know how he gets a hold of that. But I suppose he could leave. I suppose he. I keep thinking to myself, he literally can't leave the airport. That is like that Tom Hanks. Yeah, Tom the Tom Hanks, Hanks one. So that was um, someone who was stuck in Paris de Gaulle 
airport for 18 years. And what was it? It was between he couldn't go through the gates or something. Yeah, he was stuck because uh, the British government said he travelled to Britain and they wouldn't let him in. So he got transferred back to France, but France couldn't have him for some reason. I can't remember why. So he just ended up being stuck in the airport. So this man, I suppose, can just wander off if he wants. Yeah, this man's just choosing to be there and no one's telling him to leave. 14 years. Loving his life. Seems like a long time. I think airports are very depressing places. Yeah. Well, he's got a nice little seat. He's warm. He can smoke and drink and they don't seem to give a shit. I suppose if you're pissed though, right? Yeah. Good job, Mr... Ooh, I'm going to try and say his name. Wei Jiangguo. Oh, that's nice. I'm going to say that. Wei Jiangguo. I Might not he, be that. I bet he can't pronounce that when he's pissed. Oh, well, I can't pronounce it now, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, disaster. Oh, no. The real-life Barbie and the real-life Ken have fallen out. Oh, for God's sake. Oh, no, I knew this was going to happen. Uh, Valeria Lukyanova. Talk about names. Cool. <laughs> not saying Lukyanova. right. Lukyanova. Who is the real-life Barbie. Yeah. And Justin Jedlika, who is the real-life Ken. They don't get along. They're not mates anymore. This isn't really a new, new story. It's just something that I found recently. <laughs> Valeria Lukyanova, uh, who was born in 1985 in Moldova, which is described as a mostly forgotten remnant of the Soviet Union, which seems a bit harsh, because I mean, it's, it's not at harsh. all. I mean, they have a Eurovision. I was entry, about to say, I mean, I do only know of it because of the Eurovision, but, <laughs> you know, fine. Uh, she has had plastic surgery, although she claims to have only had her boobs done, but she definitely hasn't, uh, to make her look exactly like Barbie. And she uses her appearance to promote her ideas about spirituality and mysticism. Uh, she may resemble a doll more than an actual human, but she claims she's never set out to look like the iconic blonde Barbie. Instead, she simply wants to look beautiful, feminine and refined. Unfortunately, she is also a massive racist, uh. Uh, but I'm not going to get into her racist opinions. But her main goal, and this is great actually for a racist, I would encourage all racists to take this up, is to become a breatharian in which you only exist on air and sunlight. A breatharian? <laughs> Apparently this is the thing. I think I've heard of this before. What? It's you people just don't that eat? give up food and you just exist on air and sunlight. Oh, which fantastic. is, again, if you're a racist, a brilliant idea. Brilliant. Just do that. Uh, she also believes in astral projection and claims that she is actually an alien being herself. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> she came under fire. Must be all that air and sunlight she's eating. <laughs> I'm not going to say any of her racist views because that's what they go through next. Um, but she's also against feminism. So she's the best. She's the best breatharian you could possibly imagine. Long live now, her, except not. Now Just her, keep breatharian. Yeah. Her rival, the human Ken doll, Justin Judlika, he was born in Plowkeepsie in New York in 1980. And uh, he has, he's got no problems about admitting all of his various plastic surgery. He describes himself as an enthusiast. He has had rhinoplasty, mm. chest, bicep, tricep and shoulder implants, brow lifts, cheek augmentations, subpectoral implants, gluteoplasty and lip augmentations. Now, to see this man is uh, something else. And I think, by the way, that everybody listening to this should immediately Google both these people, if you haven't already. Jared isn't quite as much of a lunatic as his, uh, as his counterpart. Um, but he has spent 800 grand on 780 cosmetic procedures. Oh, my God. Uh, trying to become the best version of himself. He says, when I go into the doctors, I don't go in for consultations anymore because I really go into pitch. <laughs> to pitch? Because <laughs> he's just come up with all of these crazy ideas that he wants to do. He likes to be a guinea pig, he said. Oh, God. But needless to say, he has been attracted by trolls in the past, like people who ask him if he has an anatomical match with Ken in terms of his famously non-existent genitals. In response, don't worry, Justin comes back hard. Actually, Comes I wish, back hard? I, oh, yeah. <laughs> hey. Hey. Actually, I wish it was dragging on the ground like in anime. <laughs> so this man lives in a fantasy world. Life in plastic is fantastic. Indeed. Ooh. Well, anyway, they're feuding. They're feuding. Uh, not really for any particular reason. I just thought it was funny that they're feuding. Human Ken doll blasted Valeria, saying that she presents herself as a real-life Barbie doll, but she's nothing more than an illusion who dresses like a drag queen. Prior to meeting her, he said that he appreciated her, that she was beautiful, but added, it appears to me that much of her look is added makeup, fake hair and slimming corsets. As soon as you wipe away all that makeup, she's just plain Jane. 
<laughs> but Says for, him with his fake shoulders or whatever the fuck he's got. Well, he's certainly not playing Jane, in fairness. Um, for her part, Valeria Lukyanova, I've said it so many times I'm getting confident yeah. now, said that he would do better not to comment on who is plastic and who is not. I, but I think he's a handsome man, but he overdid his lips. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you saw this man and you could just pick out his lips as what he's overdone, you would realise how absurd that is. <laughs> So, again, not really a new news story. Doesn't really go anywhere. But I just like the fact that there was... And this is two beef stories. Two beefs. Well, on the topic of surgery, woman's UTI turns out to be a glass tumbler lodged in her bladder for four years. A glass tumbler? She had a glass tumbler inside her bladder. Right. How did it happen? <laughs> Inquiring minds need to know. Oh my god! So I read this and I knew how it, she got it. What you know? What kind of play was going on to get the glass tumbler there? It's only now that I read it out loud as to what because I kind of envisaged it somewhere else in my brain. Mm, what, the so it's in her bladder. Yeah, I got it. But she used the glass as a sex toy. So this means at some point it's really gone in the wrong hole. It really has. Really, really, <clears throat> really gone in the wrong hole. So basically, four years ago, she used it as a sex toy. How, and... how what do you... What, just as a dildo? <sighs> like, what? As, a glass tumbler isn't the thing you immediately think of. It's not what you would think of. But she, you know, by accident, and I don't know how anyone's <laughs> accidentally doing this, put it in the urethra <laughs> rather than like her that's vagina. Impossible. I literally... This has got to be... But it's not fake. I mean... So basically, she had a bladder stone eight centimetres wide, and when they cracked it open, there was a glass tumbler inside it. What the living fuck? What? And there's a picture of it. <laughs> we love people getting things stuck inside themselves. On well, I know. So ap- apparently, there is this thing called urethral sounding, which is a risky activity that involves inserting a glass or object into the urethra to heighten sexual pleasure and arousal. I have never heard of this. Um, doctors have had reports of people deliberately placing things there, either due to mental health problems or for pleasure. <laughs> but it is not recommended. <laughs> One question I do have as well, though. Yeah. Probably more importantly, she mustn't have known it was there. Like, if you're doing it as a sex game, like, I suppose just replace it with something a little bit less weird. But- if you were using a dildo yeah. and then suddenly the dildo had vanished, <laughs> you wouldn't then just go four years and just figure, oh, that dildo's probably not up there. It's probably fine. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, and there's no there's no mention of her, like, forgetting about it. But she must have. Or... There's no way you could have. I don't, I don't really understand. Yeah, they really don't actually mention how she just forgot that she put a, di- a, put a glass tumbler up herself. <laughs> four years. And she just thought she had a UTI and was like, what's going on? Maybe she was very drunk or on drugs or something. Maybe. maybe they were doing, and they don't mention They were doing dr- that. druggy sex, maybe. Yeah. And then forgot about it. I mean, just, oh, there's a picture. Uh, I'll find a way to find the picture and, and share it with people. It's quite, a, oh, it's just, it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant. It's all eight centimetres wide, this fucking bladder stone. And they crack it open and there's a sex tumbler. Did the tumblers break? Uh, no, it was in. No, it was. I think it only broke inside the when they smashed open the bladder stone. Uh, it's a shame that they broke it because really, if she was really classy, she would have then had like a shot out of it <laughs> as they got it out. <laughs> That's the only way. If you're going to find a tumbler in your bladder, get it out. And get shot. it out. Do a fucking shot. Do out a of it. shot. Yeah. As they as they're like carting you through the through the hospital <laughs> on your bed with your IV drip, <laughs> and you've got a gritty gritty fucking tumbler that's come out your bladder. Yeah. Whoa. Probably sm- smacking the bean while you're coming Aww. up because you're so obsessed with. <laughs> so there you go. Accidental or not, maybe deliberate insertion of a glass up the urethra. I mean, Fucking come on. Fuck off. Definitely deliberate. <sighs> Just, I mean, we've talked about catheterization before, but <laughs> fucking hell. A fucking glass tumbler. It's not a shot glass. That is a glass that you have juice out of. There's also, like, it would get in the way of pissing, yeah. at least for a while. I mean, it obviously worked its way further in. But to begin with, she must have... I mean, I'm surprised she wasn't riddled with UTIs, like, constantly. Four years! There's just something wrong about this story. They've left out some major details. And, of course, the other thing is with UTIs is they make you go insane. 
So <laughs> she would have been... Fucking mad. She would have been mad the whole time. She must have just continuously had various UTIs. It must I mean, be why she forgot she had a glass up herself. I suppose. Maybe that's why they, like, drip-fed that information about mental health issues. They haven't stated it. Jesus Christ. Bless her. I mean, again... We're sex positive on this podcast. Sex positive and mental health nurses. And yeah, so I mean, if you want to do all of these things, go at it. But be careful. If, if you're going to lose something, don't ever lose something inside no, your own body. Like, you know when you or go get to... get it dealt with You know you when do. you're in theatre and you count all your knives and then at the end you have to count everything. <laughs> if you're doing sex toys and putting things in yourself, just maybe make an inventory and count, <laughs> count everything back into the drawer when you're finished. Make sure you haven't forgotten anything in that there. That is so sexy, what you've just described there. <laughs> That is, uh, whew, mommy, people pay for that sort of thing. <laughs> Just to watch a dominatrix slowly count all of her different things. And tick <laughs> count them, them off in the and then count them back Like a out. little register. <laughs> yeah. Like in- Nine inch dildo, internal, check. Internal Twelve buckaroo. inch dildo, check. <laughs> <laughs> Glass tumbler for my urethra. Oh, shit, not there. <laughs> when did I put that in there? Oh, fuck my life. Go to the hospital. <laughs> anyway, talking about dildos. Oh, really? Do you know, I mean, no, not at all. Do you know uh, somebody called Drake Wirtz, who used to be a WWE referee? No. He was formerly a wrestler who went by the name Drake Younger. And Drake Younger used to do loads of those death matches. Oh, okay. Where they hit each other with light tubes and get themselves all fucked up. We've watched some. We've probably. Loads of glass, loads of things. Yeah, we've had a few late night drunken. YouTube holes watching death matches, oh, so I'm, and I think yeah. he was like quite a big one. Oh, okay, during his time, so we probably have seen him. I don't well, really recognise him though. Anyway, he became he left the death match scene, mm-hmm. and I think was kind of for some reason, and I imagine it becomes clear now. For some reason, was slightly shunned. I think from the wrestling world, but, okay. a, but a few years later came back and had quite a successful career as a WWE referee. Okay. We don't really watch WWE, so I don't really know. But he then, during COVID, became obsessed with QAnon. Oh, for God's sake. Like some people I know in this room. I'm yeah. He, well, <laughs> not, not quite in the same <laughs> no, way. No, not the same way. I'm joking. <laughs> um, he had a number of controversies in which he spoke out about not wearing masks mm. um, and was eventually fired from WWE in May last year. Since then, he is running as a candidate for the Republican nomination for a Florida state representative in the 30th district. Right. I don't really know what any of that means. Nah. Anyhow, he, keeping in mind that one of the reasons that he was fired from the WWE was that at one of the events, they gave a talk to everyone about anti-racism. And as soon as they started the talk, he got up and left because he was so disgusted. Um, and he also believes that there is a child trafficking ring... All the QAnon shit. All the, all the usuals. Um, and has loudly criticised other wrestlers for receiving vaccinations for the COVID-19 virus. Anyhow, he's running as a candidate for the Republican nomination. So he's been asking for people to give him some money to support him. And here is a list of the, ref- the wrestlers who have given this horrible racist QAnon cunt. Oh God, please don't be anyone I know. Not no, lots of money. <laughs> no, well, to be honest, so we don't really know a lot of these, but people out there probably will. Riddle, who is Matt Riddle, right? Oh, that one that doesn't wear shoes. He wears slip-on no. shoes. So he's dreadful anyway. But I mean, I'm quite surprised. I wouldn't have had him down as a racist necessarily, but I don't know anything about him. Somebody called Cross with a K, who I think used to be called Killer Cross, who I'm certain is one of the ones who. WWE let go fairly recently, oh, okay. so possibly for the same reasons. Elias. Elias was the man who <gasps> no! used to play the guitar. Someone called Oni Lorcan. No, and somebody called Jimmy Jacobs. Jimmy Jacobs is an older guy, definitely. He used to be a wrestler. But the only person who I did know on this list, and it won't it's not going to upset you particularly, but it is someone from AEW, is Bobby Fish. Oh dear, Bobby Fish. And so those people Tut-tut. all gave money to this man's political campaign there's no excuse for this i'm sure some of them probably did it because he was their mate or something mm. but that's still not an excuse I don't know. it's not a good one uh, is it i would like to say this man bobby fish he's recently coming to aew which is the wrestling that we do watch and he's bought his fucking friend what's his name oh, kyle o'reilly. o'reilly kyle o'reilly is someone who appears to have forgotten what it is to 
pretend to be a human. Yeah. We talk about this sometimes in some of the trashy movies that we do. Yeah. Where people are asked to act and they don't really know how to act and so they completely forget how to even present themselves as a human. Yeah. And they start to act in a very strange way. This fucking man who admittedly didn't give money to a racist, so I suppose I should be able to go his tag team partner, really, but I'm not. Uh, he is the most over-the-top, ridiculous, kind of grotty looking as well. Not that that, should be, not that that should be important, but he looks dirty. He sometimes acts <laughs> as if he's forgotten he has a spine. Yeah. Like, he just, like, stoops around. Like, he thinks he's really... Yeah, this look makes me look sinister. And it's like, it makes you look like you've taken ketamine. Yeah, like that's just, exactly just, what it looks like. But we, but, and then you're doing a weird face, again, because maybe you've taken ketamine. I think he's quite respected, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to find this. But if I can find a YouTube video of his most over-the-top walks, because <laughs> it's mostly his walk. When he walks from, you know how people come out in wrestling, even if you're not a wrestling fan, yeah. I'm sure you can picture people in pants walking down an yeah. aisle. When he walks... It's like his legs aren't connected to the rest of his body <laughs> for some reason, but he's doing it deliberately. He thinks it makes him look cool. Oh, and it's so that. weird. He's so it. weird. Anyway, his tag team partner also gave money to a racist. Tut tut. And their music is wonderful. Oh, it sounds like weird 90s horror punk. It is, I think it is weird 90s horror punk. <laughs> no, it's like a band is. from uh, New Jersey, I think. Is that, is they, that sound from, like, they sound like Yeah, it's New obviously Jersey. like, well, they started on the indies and had this like, what I imagine is like a local horror punk band do their music. And then when they came to AEW, they brought with them their indie music. And everyone's yeah. like, yeah! And it just sounds, it's mastered way lower than yeah. all the other songs. <laughs> yeah. And it just sounds like absolute dog shit compared to, but I really do quite like it. Well, there was that weird time. I feel like I'm going to pick a year. I think it was probably around about the mid noughties where there was a, a horror punk. It didn't really become big, but in a sort of underground way, it sort of became big. Yeah. And everyone started trying to do Glenn Danzig impressions. Yeah, that's singer. what this one is. And this is definitely that. And the problem is, say what you will about Glenn Danzig, it's really hard to sing like him. So, even, unless, so unless you're really good. Well, and even Glenn Danzig can't really do it well, in the like, late 90s, early 2000s. Oh, it's he got, could in the late oh, 90s. Oh, no, no, no. There is one of his Danzig albums that you put on sometimes <laughs> that he just sounds like a parody of himself. Right. Like, because only Disagree. he can only do it for a little bit. I, I love him. Don't I worry. only listen to the good Danzig, so Siobhan is wrong. No, there's you one where he just sounds like... His industrial <laughs> <laughs> and it just sounds like he's drunkenly fallen over. I think I'm, I'm almost a hundred percent certain that you're talking about my favourite Danzig album. So I'm gonna just forget that you said it and move on. All right. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to stab you in the bottom. <laughs> right. I've got one more. Woman sets new world record by scoffing the most chicken nuggets in a minute. <laughs> For fuck's sake. Is it you? Did it's you not me. Sneak off and but do I have this? tried to do this before. <laughs> I haven't set myself a minute once. I just sat there and decided I was going to eat chicken nuggets till I felt sick. Um, <laughs> That's not setting a world record, you <laughs> I, came, I came home and I'd watched too much of this man versus food or whatever. And I was like, Mel, put the oven on. I'm eating chicken nuggets for no reason. Anyway, someone's... For the listener, Mel is Siobhan's mate. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, you're not on the phone, Siobhan. <laughs> Anyway, someone called Leah Schuttkeva, who, depressingly, I'm already aware of because on my <laughs> night shifts, I get bored and sometimes watch people doing eating challenges. And it is an absolute waste of life. And these people are the worst human beings in the world because, you know, there's a world of starving people out there and then there's these people scoffing food for time. And yet you're giving them views, which is the only Not just currency, giving them views. The I'm talking currency, about them right now. The only currency that they understand. This woman ate... 19 chicken nuggets in 60 seconds. Oh, fuck off. I can yeah. eat way so more this is that. this is the other thing. Well, you watch her do it, and I couldn't eat it as quick as she's eating. Oh, I feel like I could. It starts, that. and you think, gosh, she's going to eat tons. There is a really I good mean, video. keeping in mind, sorry, just to say, I'm not sure I've ever eaten an actual real chicken well, no. nugget in and my so life. And so I feel so like... I could eat a, a vegetarian uh, equivalent. And that's exactly... You know, and I'm not impressed, because these are, I think, McDonald's chicken nuggets. So, you know, there is a lot of problems. So many problems here. But, <laughs> yeah, I've watched the video, and it starts, and you think, I could fucking do that. But she's, like, scoffing. Like, just... I'm imp- Like, I don't know. I, I should one be One every three seconds, basically. Yeah, but you've got to swallow it. Yeah, it will get hot. Yeah, yeah. Right. I still it think sounds. I can do it. E- yeah, yeah, I do want to do it. I mean, a hundred percent. I'm in. Can we do this? Can we try? Maybe this can be something we save for our patreons. <laughs> oh, what, video it. Yeah. 
Paige, I'm not even kidding. You heard David say it. We're going to... Uh, let's do an eating... Let's do it. Did you just call me David? I did call you David. When it gets serious, I call you David. No, and not this... my mother. I'm not more serious than I am right now. We're going to do 60 seconds. How many chicken nuggets can we eat? Has this woman broken up? We love a world record. She's broken the world record! This is the first time you listen to the Breakfast Punks podcast. We love world records. So she has broken a world record because basically... It was 19 chicken nuggets, but they do it by weight. She gobbled up 352 grams of chicken nugget, breaking the world record of 298 grams that someone set in 2020. She smashed it. How many calories is that? Does it say? I feel like it's... We don't go into that. We We don't go into that. But um, this woman has a YouTube channel. I thought you could say this woman has a UTI. (laughs) Get, check your bladder out for that tumbler. No, she's got a YouTube channel. I bet she's channel. got a couple of chicken nuggets lost up there. <laughs> but she does. So the one thing that I would say is quite impressive about this woman and the few competitive eaters that I've accidentally looked at on YouTube is she is incredibly able at not getting it all over her face. <laughs> so she's someone who sits there. She's got these fantastic nails. She's very well done up with makeup. She's got these tiny little tops on. And then she doesn't get it all over herself. Like, I watched her eat a burger in, like, a stupid amount of time once. And there, was, and if it was me, there would just been shit all over the place. And she does it, and she just, they're very demure. And at the end, she's like, oh, that was very nice. And I'm like, how do you know? You just literally put it in your stomach. You I didn't even chew it. I think you're actually, that, you think you're complimenting the woman, but you're actually just giving yourself away. Most people can eat a burger <laughs> without getting shit all over their face. <laughs> Oh, I love it. So, yeah, it's a little... I mean, it's a horrible world to go on when you're on night shifts and you're bored and you start watching competitive eating. But if you can bring yourself to watch this woman eat a minute's worth of chicken nuggets... We'll put it on the YouTube it's quite, It's quite a thing. So, yeah, we'll put it on the playlist and uh, log on to our Patreon soon. If you have signed up, if you haven't, then maybe this will persuade can you, ima- you. Can you imagine how much shit she going to get do on this? her face? When are we going to do this? I don't know. We are going to do this because you've agreed it on... on, on <laughs> All right, we're going to try and break a record on our Patreon, but you're going to have to get past our paywall. (laughs) Do you know where they eat a lot of chicken nuggets, Siobhan? I bet I do. Norfolk. For this week's Norfolk news, I've gone to the Great Yarmouth Mercury. Ooh. Uh, Great Yarmouth got its own paper. Well, yes, they do. (laughs) Every, you know, every every local, you've got a local paper in all your villages. I've, yeah. I've, in fairness, the EDP, the Norwich-based one, has been total dog shit this week. That's just traffic and who's <laughs> put in jail, as per usual. <laughs> Nothing good. So I thought I'll branch out to the villagers, and I went Great Yarm for Mercury, and lo and behold, I was not disappointed because Dustbin Dave gets a tour of Bin Factory and his own fab bin. <laughs> this is what we want to hear. This is what we want to know. And this is part of a long news thing on the Great Yarmouth Mercury. Because he's been following Dustbin been, Dave for a while. Been following Dustbin Dave for a while. Now, Dustbin Dave, he's just, he loves bins. <laughs> he just loves <laughs> bins. And uh, he's called a binfluencer. Oh, oh gosh. Because he spots bins. Like other people spot trains and planes and birds. This man. I mean, you're looking at me funny, but we remember that bin we found in Kent in Margate. That was as oh, big we as found a house. A massive bin, but that's not the same. Mm. That's one of the most impressive bins I've ever seen, actually. So exactly, I can well, see why Dave went down this. Uh, Dave Clark, good boy. He uh, he has his own uh, social media following about seeing bins, and he puts up pictures of bins he likes, and and he and he spotted one at Thrigby Wildlife Centre. <laughs> If you've ever been to Norfolk, you'll know Thrigby. That's where they got lions and tigers. <laughs> and it's in a country house and you can walk over the uh, tiger enclosure and wave at them. It's very harsh, oh, really. It's not too far from Pettits, which I've mentioned before. You have. Where you can go feed some goats and have a nice time. Uh, it's all near the broads. If you've ever been to Thrigby, you'll know what I'm talking about and the joy that it brings you. Because it's... <laughs> you laugh! I fucking love it. Um... But he went there and he wasn't too fussed about the tigers, but he saw a bin that was like the fab ice lolly. Oh. That's all decorated like that. And he was like, I've got it. I must find out more about this bin. Put up pictures about it. And and the, the, the world, I say the world, the small bit of social media following that he's got, got very excited for him and contacted the makers of this bin, BDH Tulford. And lo and behold, 
he got to go on a tour of the factory who make these bins and there's a picture of him with all the all the oh all the bins <laughs> he's next to a smarties one a round trees one a kelly's ice cream one. Oh, oh so it is an actual fab oh, lolly he's so having I thought it, a nice time yeah i thought it was that it was like accidentally looked a bit like a fab oh, lolly it is dressed up to look exactly like a fab lolly and in fairness it is a dash and bin <laughs> that's, that's a beauty um the person who where is he the person who uh, runs bdh tulford was uh, very happy to show him round. And Mr Dave Clark, he said, it was great to meet everyone at BDH Tulford and thank you for the bin. What a fab bin it is. What? Two, two things. What does he look like? Uh, I reckon he looks about early 40s. Um, he's got jeans and shoes on. Jeans and shoes. Jeans and shiny shoes. Uh, very excited to be with bins. Yeah. Many pictures of him looking very excited next to bins. Yeah. You're not describing him enough. What else would you Tell like to know about Tell me about him? his face. Is he a handsome man? Very smiley. Smiley man. Very smiley. Does he look Grinning like, from ear to ear. Do you, does he look like he would be able to get a job? Yeah. So my second question is, why doesn't he just get a fucking job in the bin factory? Surely it's not that difficult. He might have a job at some... I don't know what Well, no, he's is. gone. He's visited the bin factory. Well, I don't think he... Uh, well, he has been recruited... <laughs> As the face of the company's new recycling scheme. So maybe he does work there now. What a company that is. Um, they've, got, they've got Dustbin Dave as the, the face of something. Well, they said it was wonderful to meet Dave. As soon as we saw the story, we thought it would be wonderful to give him his own fab bin. It is always nice to meet a fan. When the fuck else? <laughs> when the fuck else have they met anyone else who likes bins as much as this man? Well, if people are following him on... Social media, and he's a binfluencer. A binfluencer. You've got to presume that there are other bin aficionados. In well, the world, there is. Um, his passion for bins went global on <laughs> Bin's fantastic Facebook page and World of Bins on Twitter. Oh my god! Um, talking enthusiastically about bins, I always mention where it started, and it is with this fab bin. He said, seeing the bin again was like being reunited with an old friend. I think he says that because I can't imagine <laughs> that he's probably ever had a friend. He's got a lot of in- internet friends. Bless him. No, I'm sure he does. I'm sorry, Dave. You are, you're a legend, obviously. After this bin kicked it all off, it was perfect to actually own one and to complete the fab bin story. I met him. I took it home with me. It's in my passenger seat with the seatbelt on and I'm using it for inside recycling. I've been reading quite a lot about psychology recently. Yeah. And about uh, the minor things that happen to us in early life, which cause our future behaviour. What do you reckon happened to this boy? I don't know. Did Put you... in a bin? Well, no, because he likes the bin. So Mothered by think, a bin? Do you think that the only time his parents ever gave him any love was when he took the bins out? Or... Think Freudian. Too. They fed him from the bin. No, so it's, think... like it's, it's like his... Uh, oh, Food comes from the bin. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like that would Maybe, be a, that would be an abusive thing. They, and he wouldn't therefore love the bins. It, te- it has to be something. He has to he has to have in his early part of his life oh. attributed love and comfort and care to bins. Why May, Christmas presents were hidden in the bins outside? Well, oh, maybe. I've had a Christmas present hidden in the wee bin. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. <laughs> my uh, my mum used to go shove all the Christmas presents around our friend Lorraine's and then in the middle of the night she'd come and dump them in the bin for us and then in the morning my mum would go and get the presents. Well, I mean, that's classic Father Christmas, that. <gasps> just don't come down the chimney, mate. Just chuck them in the bin. That's what Hermes do. <laughs> <laughs> Hermes DPD. Safe place, probably. That's in your recycling bin and we haven't told you, so I'll probably just go in the bin next time that the bins come round. Uh, who knows? Who knows? But Dustbin Dave, he's it's having a nice time. Something to think about. Dustbin Dave's psychological. Well, it all started world. with the fab lolly bin, so maybe it's more about fab lollies. What could have happened with the fab lolly in his childhood that I might have affected his, him so much? He might want to check his urethra. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that bombshell, should we play a song? Yeah, let's do it. This song is by Disaster Forecast. It's another band that we've played before on the podcast. They're fucking brilliant. Uh, This is from their new EP, How to Skate Everything. It's available online now. It's literally just come out. Disaster Forecast are from Sheffield. And this song is called Identity Parade.
to all our lovely Breakfast Punks podcast listeners. Did you know that you can now support us via our Patreon? We have a number of different tiers that you can support us on and if you give £3 or more then you will get an extra monthly episode of this very podcast in which you may hear such intellectual nuggets as these. What's the picture that you've taken of your penis where it looks at its very best? <laughs> <laughs> Would you get hard? You won the lottery. lottery. (laughs) (laughs) What's your controversial opinions? Social media's going to kill us. I quite like Gary Glitter. Yeah. (laughs) What the fuck? If you could finger one thing, what what would you you finger? Oh, you're such a twat. I know. Please do a double (laughs) fuck. Well, I think he accidentally got me in the in the nether region. Well. I was like, <laughs> I don't know about this birthday treat, but it feels a bit weird. <laughs> Daniel Filth is on his first date there, <laughs> furiously masturbating to someone's vaginal skin. Maybe I should have stuck with paedophiles. <laughs> <laughs> so sign up now at patreon.com forward slash breakfast punks podcast. Thanks for your money. Welcome back to Breakfast Punks Podcast. We're now going to move on to our main subject for this episode, which is the Hopeless Records compilation, Hopelessly Devoted to You. We're doing this almost like as a sort of continuation of what is possibly going to become a series, because we quite enjoyed doing it. Uh, A few episodes ago, we did Punkarama, which was the Epitaph, first Epitaph record sampler. Well, it wasn't a sampler, it was actually a compilation. Mm -hmm. This one is an actual real life sampler. Um, and we th- quite enjoyed doing that, so I think we might do a few of these. Yeah. And this one is much more obscure than Punkarama, yeah. I would think. I uh, don't know how many people would know about this necessarily. It was a really big one for me, because basically I found it in Tower Records when I was 16, and it was three quid, and it was a punk album, and it had a cool front cover, and so I bought it. And so as a result of that, these bands were like seem to me to be extremely important but yeah. even if and some of them did some yeah, of them went are. on to like bigger things and stuff and definitely hopeless records was kind of it def, it just wasn't like at the time in the 90s like when fat records and epitaph were the big labels i would say hopeless was like uh, uh, and also ran and also ran yeah but Do, doing the same but not as big not quite as big but it has gone on to become which we will get onto much later mm. Uh, something entirely different. In a similar-ish way to Epitaph, I would have said, when we yeah, went down that but hole. I think much worse, but yes. We'll get there. <laughs> but, so if you are, probably if you are under the age of about 30, maybe even 35, and you're listening to this and you're thinking, what the fuck are they doing Hopeless Records for? Yeah. You will only be used to the fact that Hopeless Records releases horrible shit pop music. Yeah. But it started off as a pop-punk label with some fucking great bands on it. Very much did. So Hopeless Records was started in 1993 by a guy called Louis Posen, or Louis Posen. I don't know how you would say this, but I... probably Louis, St. Louis. St. Louis? It's it's the Louis as in St. Louis. But it's not spelt the same as 88 Fingers Louis. <sighs> <laughs> oh, that is so true. Okay, I'm going to go with Louis Posen. Yeah. Louis is short for Louis. I don't think anyone cares. Who gives a fuck? <laughs> um, so it started in 93 by him. And he wasn't looking to start a label, it sounds like. He basically made a video for, as described on the Hopeless Records 
website, the now legendary punk rockers Guttermouth. I mean, if by legendary you mean really problematic. <laughs> yes. Legend, like infamous. Let's go for infamous. Yeah. Um, he was directing a video for them and they said, could you put out a seven inch, even though you don't really know what you're doing? Um, so he read the book How to Run an Independent Record Label. Mm-hmm. He asked Fat Mike for tips. <laughs> And he read magazines and paid attention to adverts. Uh, this is what all of us says on here. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history. So basically, he put out a gutter mouth seven inch in uh, in ninety three, and lo and behold, hopeless records starts. But he doesn't consider that it was a particularly meaningful thing until around the time of ninety six when these samplers came out. And he said that it wasn't just his anymore. Turns out people like these records, um, people are paying attention to it, and lo and behold, it all takes off. So this sampler was kind of the beginning of Hopeless Records really making a name for themselves and feeling as if they were part of the pop-punk scene properly. And Um, I definitely remember it being something like... And again, I don't know how much this was just influenced by the fact that, like, for example, I had it. But, like, I remember all of my mates really liking this song. Yeah. It was a time, again, we won't go through it all again, but... Uh, we talked about this on the Punk or Armor episode. Obviously, it was a time before the internet. Record labels didn't have a way of getting their music out there. So they all made these samplers. Yeah. And it became very much like the done thing. And this was definitely an early one, but it would have been after Punk or Armor. It would have been after fat music for fat people and what have you. And I would say that the bands on here, not, I mean, on this sampler and on the samplers that follow just after, but they are bands that were signed at the same time as this sampler coming out, yeah. were... They may not have gotten as big as the ones that are on that Epitaph one, but I think they're better and maybe have been very influential. A couple of them are very influential, maybe more so than their band ever got. I think doing this compilation in some respects is a very strange uh, choice because the bands that were signed immediately after this compilation are the ones that I think most people will remember. Mm. And most of them aren't on this. And then, of course, Hopeless Records, like we said earlier, became known for something completely different to this. Yeah. So this was just this really was just like a snapshot in time yeah. of 1996 and the bands that they had. But there were some fucking great bands on there. Yeah. So we're going to do exactly what we did with the Punkorama episode, and we're just going to run through the tracks. Yeah. So the first song on here is Guttermouth, the uh, band that started the whole thing, I guess. And the song is called Hopeless, which is very fitting. Well, Guttermouth never really released anything on Hopeless Records. Oh, did they not? <laughs> did they not? <laughs> no, they did. They released a seven inch, which, which like must you be said, that first, that one. first seven inch. But then, uh, other than that, uh, their stuff came out on lots of different uh, record labels. That's fair enough. Um, I think that this, I presume that the record label was named after the song because the song oh. is called Hopeless and it starts. I always thought that. They just picked this song because they're not, like I say, they're not really a hopeless band. Hmm. But I always thought they'd just pick this song because the first line is like 17 and hopeless and I don't care. And so I thought they'd just thought to themselves, well, we're called Hopeless Records. Yeah. These are our mates and they've got this song. Yeah. But I think it must be. I didn't know that story about the the Uh... first seven inch. So I think it must be what it was named after. Gutter Mouth were, had already been around for a really long time and they continued going and to some extent kind of still exist. I think it, they've only, it's just the vocalist has always been, had different musicians around oh, okay. him. They're one of those bands who like to consider themselves shocking and they're kind of like, you know, not politically correct mm. and nothing overly problematic, really. But they did get thrown off of the Warp Tour in 2004. Okay. Um, but I will say, why did they I'm get not thrown off? totally against this. I think it was probably a little bit that they were saying dodgy things because oh. they used to say a lot of dodgy things on stage. But fundamentally, the reason they got... <laughs> and this is this sort of tells you where punk rock went and definitely where Hopeless Records went um, following on from this. In 2004, they got thrown off the Walk Tour because they took the piss out of all the other bands on the Walk Tour and the other bands didn't like it. Oh. A band such as A Simple Plan and My Chemical Romance. <laughs> <laughs> But they also Fair took the enough. piss out of a lot of those bands because the Warped 2004 was the one where George Bush was going for a re-election. Mm-hmm. And so Fat Mike was doing all of that not my president thing and yeah. was trying to get people to vote. And as a result of that, there was an awful lot of, should we describe them as very empty politics from a lot of pop punk bands yeah. who had no place really getting involved in politics. And I suppose it was a simple thing. And it's not obviously not wrong. They were all just saying, don't vote for George Bush. Mm. That's fine. But Guttermouth thought that they were all 
idiots. So as a result, they started saying you should vote for George Bush oh, <laughs> on <dear>. the water. Oh. <laughs> so they were asked to leave. Oh dear. They're not a very good band. Nah. In my opinion. But like I say, I think they're, you know, they came more out of the skate scene and stuff. They have a very specific sound, which isn't really up my street. But it probably influenced an awful lot of late 90s pop punk and skate punk music. Uh, uh, the only lyric I remember from this song is he slammed his nads in the kitchen door. Yes. I think he <laughs> said nuts, though. It sounds like nads. I really <laughs> I hope don't think nads. Americans say nads as, <laughs> as, uh, as bull bag. I don't know, but it didn't sound like nuts either. I think he said nads. <laughs> I mean, I've been listening to Look this Look it up for and email J- uh, Shamsi Races at Gmail. 26 years. Yeah. And I've only ever heard the word nuts. Oh, so I think I heard is, it. So that nuts doesn't mean and... I'm right. It might be that the first time 16-year-old me heard it and was like, well, he said nuts. That's really funny. If he said nuts, I don't like them. If they say nuts, I think, okay. <laughs> I, think I think they're all right. <laughs> don't Americans say nards instead of nuts? That's nards. what he said. Nah. Yeah, nards. Nah. Oh, nuts. I'm almost sure he says nads. <laughs> or nards. <laughs> All right, well, next band is 88 Fingers Louie, and they've got a couple of songs on here, uh, both of which are all right, or one of them's a Misfits cover. It is. The Misfits <laughs> cover's really weird. Let's start with that one, because yeah. the Misfits cover, don't know quite how they've done it. It almost sounds a little bit like they've taken the actual backing track of the Misfits song, which is Night of the Living Dead, Yeah. and he's just sung over the top of it. Like, the production is exactly the same. Is this, is this a good thing? I think this is a, is that a good thing. Or is there any point thing? to doing it? Well, exactly. Do it, I don't know. Like... You tell me. Like, I would say there's not that much point of doing it, but it is a fucking banging song. Yeah, it is a really nice song. Uh, and they do an all right cover of it, I guess. Unlike those wrestlers' theme tune music, he doesn't really try and sound like Glenn Danzig. <laughs> no, it doesn't. So it works, I think. Yeah. It, yeah, he doesn't. It, it does sound quite good. I quite liked it. But EA Fingers Louie are from Chicago. I was going to say were from Chicago because they did split up at some point. But uh, they've got back together and they're yeah. touring and they played MPF. Yeah. I think it was the last MPF, but obviously that's not last year. That's a couple of years ago now. Three years ago, whatever it is now. Yeah, and, 2019. Um, I have to say, 88 Fingers Louie did not live up to my expectations. Oh, no. Uh, they were really boring and rubbish. Oh, shit. I thought live. Uh, they played, uh, maybe not on the, I think it was the same MPF as Sam I Am played, who were from a similar era, mm. and Sam I Am were fucking brilliant. Even And the, obviously these people are all sort of the same age, in fact Sam I Am are probably older than them. Yeah. But they really went for it, but AA Fingers Louie just looked tired and bored oh. to me. Which is a shame. They were always a band, they're another one, I think they were kind of influential, sort of skate punk, sort mm. of hardcore but really melodic. Um, and I think they did influence quite a lot of other people, but they never, to me, they were never like that good yeah they had a load of albums that sort of were fine they were all fine just nothing like stand out that to you no i know two facts where well, i learned two facts about aa fingers louis mm-hmm. first one their name where it came from do you know i well, I, I do but i can't remember <laughs> it's the uh, piano salesman in the flintstones oh yes <laughs> and the bassist went on to form rise against so there you go i mean i don't really know what to say with that the bassist was probably the coolest one the singer oh, well. always looked a little bit like a nerd, and the guitarist looked like a heavy metal dude. Oh. I can't remember what the drummer looked like, oh. but the bass player always looked like he was the cool one. And yet... Oh, is that not... Cuss is not cool. <laughs> I don't think it's any less cool than being an 88 Fingers Louie. Probably not. Honest, and I guess Against. Rise Against did well, yeah, so, you I know. Yeah, I think it's fine. I, I think, think it's, it's all right. It's much of a muchness. Speaking of cool, the next, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the next band... Oh, I like them, and you love them. Digger. Yeah, I fucking love Digger, <laughs> They're definitely not cool. And you can tell they're not cool. Like, I, <laughs> bless, I know that this kind of music lends themselves to being like kind of nerdy, hopeless, teeny boys. But Digger really sound like nerdy, hopeless, teeny boys. <laughs> like, always. Um, maybe it's just because, I mean, one of the songs is I Want My Hat Back, where it's literally just shouting about how he wants his hat back from some girl. I mean, literally just makes it sound like it's not the greatest piece of poetry <laughs> ever written by anybody in the history of time so i don't necessarily <laughs> agree with your attitude there i know um so we played digger on this podcast yeah. in one of the old songs we played we i, want, played my I want my hat back uh it is i think the perfect song <laughs> possibly <laughs> it's beautiful and you do do a funny thing when it comes on uh, it's just all about someone whose relationship has broken down and the girl still has his hat and he fucking wants it back. He wants it and back. And he's got a terrible haircut. So he doesn't he needs want to his, talk to her. He doesn't want to talk to her, but he wants his hat back. Yeah. 
And uh, it's. I mean, we've given away all the lyrics as well. Even though there's nothing more to it, but it's perfection. It's absolute pop punk perfection. It is very in good, in my opinion. Digger were fucking brilliant, and they're another band who split up uh, in I think the early two thousands. They did put a few feet wrong towards the end of their oh, really? career. Oh. They made an emo album, oh. which didn't didn't really work very well. Uh, but they got back together a few years ago now, and I think they still play very occasionally. Obviously, COVID put an end to all of this. Yeah. Diggy used to play a lot with Weston, which is uh, Alex James from Beachland. And they also band. have songs about how their clothes are good or bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think, if I remember rightly, when Digger got back together, they might have even played Fest, but they definitely uh, played a bunch of more gigs with Weston and stuff. Yeah, I just fucking love them. I, I just think that they were really, really underrated. The album that I Want My Hat Back is from is called Power Bait, and it's not that great, mm. apart from... I want my hat back, which again, as we've Pure made clear, poetry. absolute perfection. Uh-huh. But the second album, A Promise of an Uncertain Future, is just fucking brilliant. It's like such a perfect album. And they did another one after that called Monte Carlo, which has got some good stuff on it, but they'd sort of started to go off the, off the thing. But on, A Promise of an Uncertain Future is just such a fucking great album. And I would recommend it to anybody. It is like proper pop punk, but not pop punk in the sense, and this is maybe an important point to make about all of these bands, is that what pop punk came to be known, Mm. I feel like today we see pop punk in two ways. We see Screeching Weasel and Ramones and then what that led to. So like Teenage Bottle Rocket and all of that sort of stuff that's around now. There's that pop punk. And then there's pop punk, as I think a lot of younger people will know it, which is more or less like Newfound Glory. Yeah, we do not mean that. We definitely don't mean either of those things. This was an era whereby pop punk meant someone something slightly different. Yeah. And Digger, I think, are one of the more perfect examples of whatever that was that it meant. Yeah. And I suppose, it, you know, it does run the risk. A lot of it is kind of like white boys singing about how upset they are that girls have left them. There is a I mean, lot of that. an awful lot of this album is that. Oh, loads of it is it, that. Almost entirely that. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely one of the down points of it. But there is a part that, not to get too deep on this, <laughs> but that type of thing has become extremely uncool and for very good reason, right? And I remember the time where it was like turning. I would say towards the late 90s, particularly when emo became really big, there was, there was a point where it was just kind of like, come on, like, what is this, this scene of music that we all love has just turned into fucking boys singing about how upset they are about their emotions. And it was... That Not became... to shame people about their emotions. Well, no, that's what I'm getting yeah. to. No, no, but that was definitely to shame them. Oh. But it was for good purpose. It was kind of like saying, well, hang on, where are all the girls in the bands? Oh, where right. are all the people of colour in bands? Yeah. Where are people singing about political issues like it was an important thing it needed to happen because the punk scene and this goes for the diy punk scene i think at the time as well particularly the more melodic side of the diy punk scene had turned into this free-for-all of just you know yeah boys singing about how upset they are Mm. and so it needed to happen but i would say that that now i don't think anyone um, that maybe that's not quite true but more or less no one is doing that now and i do think that there is a place for it. Mm. In a in a from a psychological level, like melancholy is quite an important thing to explore. And in the same way as like you could argue, what's the point in writing hundreds of songs about how much we hate the Tories? Because mm. we've heard one, so there's why do we need to do a hundred? Mm. The reason you need to do a hundred is because it turns into almost like a ritual thing. It's not like, no one's teaching anybody anything anymore, but it's like we're all in this together. Yeah, and I think that that's a really important aspect of punk, DIY punk more than anything else. Mm. Uh, I don't even know what the fuck punk is nowadays. It turns out that's what I learned from going into Hopeless Records. Which we'll, we'll get. To I mean, that. I'm not sure we'll, they do. But... We'll get to that in a little while. But, you know, the ritualistic aspect of just repeating these same messages, the same goes for anything else. All the positive messages that punk gives, you know, a feminist mm. message, an anti-racist message, all of these things. It's like you don't need any more songs written about these subjects. But the reason why you do it is because of this this aspect of like, yeah, we're all in this together. Yeah, continuation all... of the same fight sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, but I would argue that some of those fights are as outdated as this one but they're more acceptable. But whereas I sort of think that, like I say, I, I just think that melancholy is something that maybe we need to explore a little bit more. I don't think I want to see loads of boys singing about how upset they are about how their relationships have ended. But actually, relationships ended is a genuine 
emotional thing that people yeah. go through, even if you are a white man. Yeah. And sometimes it can lead to really horrible things happening. Yeah. And maybe we could do with a few more people singing about how they want their hat back. <laughs> Well, be careful what you wish for, because when we went down the Hopeless Records uh, hole, there is a very young boy talking about his therapy. Yeah, but and that's we will not, get to that. But that's almost not the that's you're right. But that's almost it's not, the not the same. No, it's not. Beca- we'll get to that. Yeah, there's a fine line, and we'll we'll uh, we'll figure it out later. <laughs> Let's move on to the next band that's on here, a band called Falling Sickness. Who actually I don't know, other than on this uh, compilation, maybe you do. Well, Falling Sickness were from California. A lot of these bands are from California because that's where Hopeless was based. Yeah. And Falling Sickness are a surprise for me to go and revisit. Okay. Because um, I never really liked this song on this sample and it was definitely one that I always used to skip when I was younger. They mm. are a ska punk band. Uh-huh. But I think Falling Sickness are fucking brilliant. Oh, you've and gone back and you love it now. I was really surprised to find because, I, again, I you know, looking at it, I tended to write all the Scar bands off, and if I'm honest, I still tend to write all the Scar bands mm-hmm. off. But Falling Sickness fit way more into that kind of like they're much more Operation Ivy. They're much more. Yeah. They sound quite a lot like a band called Against All Authority, who went on to release stuff on Hopeless Records. They weren't on them at this point, and they were a great band. And probably, if this led to anything, it probably led to like crack rock steady kind of sound. Yeah. But the thing that I love about this early Fall in Sickness, so there's two Fall in Sickness albums, both of them are great, but the early stuff, A, it all sounds like it's about to fall apart, and I remember that when I was like a kid, that really put me off. I was like, why would any, there's a couple of bands on here that I've totally changed my opinion about compared to when I was a teenager. I was like, why would anybody want to listen to this? this. Like, Mm. yeah, it just sounds like they, it sounds like the drummers at any second is about to like lose the beat and, and that no one's quite in time with each other. And now, of course, that's fucking... Yeah, you know, I love that now. I think that's the thing that I love most about it. But also, they do this quite interesting thing with the... And I don't know what to describe. That upstroke guitar thing, that pick-it-up thing. Yeah. That... Dee, 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 dee. Yeah. They do that, except they don't do that. They do they it very have, fast. Yeah, they yeah. have, like, a clean sound on their guitar, but they, like, double-time that. Yeah, it's, like, completely muted, like... Dick, 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 yeah. Dick, 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 dick. And it sounds... Again, it makes it sound really messy. Yeah. But it's really effective. Like, listening to it now, through a different set of ears, I yeah. think it's really effective. They almost don't actually open the chord at any point. It's just, like, muted the entire time, but that kind of, like, upstrokey muted... Yeah. There's, like... Yeah, you wouldn't even know what they were playing. And on their second album, they got slightly better at playing. Which took something away, but yeah, you don't love it something. No, no, that album's great as well. But yeah, I think they're a fucking great band. Looking back on it, I really do, and um, really political as well, which doesn't necessarily come across. No, in this song, well, that does a little bit. This one's all about how the human race is going to dwindle and we're all going to die. Yeah, which I think, which is wonderful to put it amongst like all of these pop punk songs because yeah. everything else is all about like. Yeah, my girlfriend's broken up with me and I want my hat back. <laughs> and then there's just this song about how the human race is about to die. <laughs> so that's nice. Um, the singer of Fallen Sickness is dead, unfortunately. Um, and they never really went on to do much else. I think they're all, they all sort of were in bands here or there, but nothing of any note. Oh, well, speaking of another band that is no longer around, mm-hmm. but probably the best band on here, Funeral Oration. Which is a beautiful name. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's like a black metal band called Funeral Oration. So oh, if you really? Ever, if you ever Google, <laughs> Funeral Oration have been lost to time oh, for no. a number of reasons. But one of them is because there's a band with their name that are like a black metal band. Well, this couldn't be further from black metal. No, it could not. It's like the most beautiful sounding vocal to punk ever, I would say. It's uh, so yeah. pretty. I couldn't agree more. I mean, Funeral Oration is my favourite thing on this and one of my favourite bands from when I was a kid. Mm. They're from Holland. Are they? Uh, from Amsterdam. Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. I know um, nothing about them other than on here and they're beautiful. And it is so difficult to find any history about funeration because literally there just is none. If you try and find them on the internet, there's very sparse. There's like a really, really old school website where someone's tried to write their history and it's just really sad. It's like it would fit onto one side is... of A4. But from what I can make out, I know for a fact that two of them are dead, but I think that all of them are dead oh. for various different reasons. And whilst they were older people, they started in the early 80s. So they, by the time 1996 came around, like I considered them at the time to be old men, really. Mm. But they, in hindsight, they would have been in their 30s or something. Yeah. 
but you know, so they must have all died in like their fifties. I might, I might be wrong. I, I'm, I'm definitely heard that at least three out of the four of them have, have died, mm-hmm. and I'm sure that I heard somewhere that they were all dead. But uh, so that's really sad. Uh, probably even sadder because their music is just so beautiful and so heartbreaking. They have yeah. a sound that I would just describe as heartbreaking, which is hard to. It, dis- <laughs> I don't and know. it's specifically his vocal melodies yeah. because the actual music is amazing. But it's his choice to sing the way he sings mm. over the top. And if you listen to the lyrics, because you assume the lyrics must all be about pure heartbreak, and they're not. No, like no, some no. of the lyrics are really funny, really happy, but the way that he sings them is just like, who thought to sing like that over punk? Yeah. Is um, I don't know, but I'm glad he did because it's it's yeah, you're right. It's heartbreaking. And if you follow their like career through, so there's a great discography. It's like a two disc. CD pack that Hopeless put, put out towards the end of Funeral Racing sort of career or whatever. And um, one of the CDs is just all live stuff, but the other one uh, follows like their career through from their really early stuff. And like their first two albums, I think they recorded on a cassette player in the side of their um, practice room. Aww. which And it just sounds dog shit, but it works really well. But like their earlier stuff was a like, hardcore, mm. but he still had that voice. And it was really... Cause, so the later stuff... Uh, which is more available is is quite um, produced, mm. not in a not in a bad way in my opinion, but it probably will sound very produced for a hardcore band. But the earlier stuff wasn't, and that stuff is just like I think it would stand up with any classic hardcore band that has ever existed, mm. genuinely. And then in the mid nineties, yeah, they sort of had this resurgence, and more or less their resurgence came about from they were just this little unknown punk band that had a sort of following in Holland, and the guy that ran Hopeless Records really liked them. It was a bit like Snuff with Fat Records, yeah, but obviously they didn't go on to as much acclaim. But you know, and Snuff were probably better known as well, anyway. But like you know, Snuff weren't really a band anymore, and Fat Mike really loved them. And yeah. So they just put out an album on Fat Records, and then Fat Records was like one of the biggest record labels in the world at that time. And it's similar to that, but on a much smaller scale, yeah. I suppose. But yeah, the two songs that are on this sampler, uh, I Fall Harder and uh, Stop For A Moment, and I Fall Harder was an unreleased song that wasn't even <gasps> didn't even make it onto their album. And it's and, pure beauty. Oh my God. I mean, both of them are. Every Funeral Ration song is fucking brilliant. They released three albums on Hopeless. Uh, the second one, uh, Believer, is up there with the best 90s punk albums, in mm. my opinion. It's really, it's as good as... That Descendants album, yep. Everything Sucks, uh, it's as good as the first Dillinger 4 album, it's as good as, you you fucking name it, like it's as good as Out Come the Wolves, it's as yeah. good as all of, it, anything, you give me one album from the 90s, yeah, give me an this, album. Is, this is as good as it. If it um, hopefully we can find uh, this on YouTube and put it on the playlist for anyone who's not actually heard them before. I'd not heard Funeral Oration before, before you were playing them quite a lot. And I think you put them on the cafe playlist, so eventually it became part of our lives every day. <laughs> and it's just, yeah, until you've heard his voice, you really don't know how good this band is. If you've never heard them, you've got to go hear them. So yeah. if there's any way of putting on the YouTube playlist, we will uh, try and look them on the internet, but it sounds like it's quite hard to find them. It's but, hard to find information about them. I mean, their songs are available. And the good thing sense. about the other good thing about for all of these bands, because loads of these bands have been forgotten about, but because they're on Hopeless Records, and Hopeless Records is more or less a major label now, yeah. like all of this stuff is on Spotify. Good. You know, all of it's available because okay. because they happen to have been released by, on a label that at the time they were on it wasn't very big, yeah. and now is, you know. So that's a nice thing about that. I mean, I imagine that this music will never go out of print I was going to say but I mean it's out of print <laughs> yeah but, but it'll know, be available it will always, online it will somehow. always exist you know oh that's um, good I would say as well just to say about funeral oration like I feel like their music really has legs a lot of the lyrics are about like growing old and sort of staying punk yeah and I think that that for me anyway obviously when I was 16 whilst I could kind of vaguely appreciate it, I never really knew what that was. Yeah. But it's grown, I feel like it's grown with me through my life. It's like, they're one of the few bands that I loved when I was 16 that I would say I pretty much love with the exact same amount of passion. Yeah. You just understand it better in a different way now. Yeah. Because you're living it. Yeah. Aw. Well. From someone with a lovely voice to uh, (laughs) the nobodies. (laughs) Aw. I, yeah, the nobodies. Problematic. Sounding, <laughs> they are deliberately problematic. Yeah, um, 
It's so annoying though because I really like them. Really <laughs> like them. But the two songs on here made me think I fucking hated this band. Because yeah. if you take these songs out of context, if you listen to their album, you're like, oh, this band is just out for the lols. They're like taking the piss. They're being deliberately rude. But their songs on here make them sound like horrible incels, bastard men. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's good or bad. I mean, that isn't good. But um, <laughs> if you listen to their whole album, you're like, you totally get their point of view and their humour and their nonsense. But I, do, I would say, in amongst all of these songs that are about, oh, no, the girl doesn't like me, they're two... <laughs> well, fuck you too. No, but they're two, they're two are not <laughs> oh, like that see, at all. Oh, they're two are like, it. how fucking dare you for not even liking me? Yeah. Um, which is just, nowadays, the most problematic nonsense. The nobodies are hard to describe in yeah. 2022, I think, and and I, don't, I definitely wouldn't make any excuses for them because yeah. you're right, in a way, they are just incels and they actually were that, although obviously with a different name. Yeah. The nobodies fit into this, like, pop-punk thing where people were just desperately trying to be as unpolitically correct yeah. as they possibly could. And to some extent, there was some humour in that. So the idea... The, the nobodies, in a sort of jokey way acted like you know they were porn obsessed mm. woman hating uh idiots yeah um who you know with no brains and no education and that right? was their joke and that was but. kind of their joke but the thing is is i think that they also were that probably a yeah. little bit and it's really hard to pick that apart because there was definitely they pushed they purposefully pushed it mm. so there's like there's songs on some of their albums that just have the most, you know, words that I'm not going to just say no. out loud. But it was tongue-in-cheek, but also, is that all right that it was tongue-in-cheek? I mean, it's yeah. not all right that it was tongue-in-cheek. And it's... it was a different time, but, like, I don't know. They were purposefully trying to upset people. Yeah, so we've listened to their album before, and I've really quite liked their album, and I've kind of laughed off the lyrics and thought it was like, yeah, this is awful, but I can see that they're being funny. But there's something about the songs on this sampler, just out of con- out of the context of their album, that just stood out to me as, oh my god, these fucking awful boys. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then it made me re. Then you put the album on again, and, and 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 I was like, oh shit, I remember really liking this album. But those songs in this sampler just make me think that they're awful human beings. And where is where's the like line? Are they being silly or are they actually living this? And yeah. it sounds like they were living it. Well, but, I don't. But then but I don't knows? know. I don't is know that really... for a fact. Maybe I was just a teenager, so I believed them. Yeah, because it's know, a bit it might like just be that as well. Well, it's a bit like some of the fear songs being um, totally. And this is how I feel. Like, but for fear, I'm like, I can see it. I know what they mean. They're this is their fucking shtick. Whereas this, I'm like, mm, if it is their shtick, it's a weird shtick to pick. Yeah. Um, they've made some really cl- nice songs, but lyrically, I don't know if I'd ever if say any of their songs it, are nice. Well, no, like catchy, like fun pop punk nonsense. Yeah. That I can hear a lot of other bands like. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but not with those words. But not with those words. So. <laughs> Maybe we don't dwell on that too much. No, more. I think we should, because I, for the record, <laughs> think that nobody's are fucking brilliant. <laughs> um, I definitely have to... I, I can accept all of the problematic aspects of it, but from a purely from a musical perspective, oh, yeah. I think that they're a band... I, I hated their songs on this sampler yeah. when I was a teenager. They, I always skipped their songs. And again, it was similar to Fallen Sickness in as much as it was like, why would you choose to sound like that? Because the guy's singing voice is so bad oh, I, I, but it's but again it's great and now yeah. now i don't listen to it and think it's so bad but at the time it just sounded like like the production was awful <laughs> they were kind of playing in time <laughs> but not really obviously like the lyrics are sort of shocking and they just sounded like almost like a joke it yeah. sounds like a joke band yeah but when you actually listen to their albums and now obviously being older and understanding more where they're coming from and stuff i think that their songwriting Ignoring the lyrics, yeah. probably. But even the lyrics, the lyrics are funny. They, the lyrics know, are funny, and they're quite. I wouldn't go. I was going to call them clever. That's pushing it too much. But they are kind of for what they are. They're funny and they're clever, and they're, their songs, their songwriting is just brilliant. I yeah, think. I think there's other bands that were trying to do the shocking, silly lyric thing that neglected writing good songs to do it. Mm. They've written really good songs, and yeah. and their funny is funnier than some people's funny. The problem is how much they actually were <laughs> those problematic human beings. <laughs> but but um, a, there is a couple of things about the nobodies I want to bring up. One is that I do think that this is a clever pun. When they put an album together of like all of their seven inch tracks and stuff, instead of calling it Greatest Hits, they called it Great Ass Tits, which is funny. I'm sorry, but that's funny. 
And um, <laughs> and also their album Generation XXX, I think is just fucking brilliant. And uh, it has, this is something that I found out from listening to it literally a couple of days ago. It has Miski from City Mouse. City Mouse singing backing vocals on ah. some of the tracks, including one which is called, and I quote, these are not my words, Just Another Cunt. It's quite a good song. And you can hear a little voice in the background singing along with the chorus, which is really catchy. Aww. It's a really catchy chorus. They do annoyingly do really good catchy songs. Even the ones that are on here, Fuck You Too, gets stuck in my head a lot. And yeah. that is literally the incel anthem. <laughs> but, um, oh well, problematic and glorious for nobodies. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily... It's another... It's, it's not quite... I was going to describe it as a Gary Glitter situation. It's not quite a Gary Glitter situation, but I think if you can listen to them without giving them any money, then you should. <laughs> One of them ended up in the queers, I think. I was going to say they're very, that sort of, I can see that. And there's a version of a song that Joe Queer sings on, uh, which is a song from their album, Short Songs for Short Attention Spans, but it's not the version that's on that album. The song's called Scarred by Love, and it's actually a fucking beautiful song, all about how their mate died. And uh, it's really lovely. Uh, The version with Joe Queer is probably better. But uh, unfortunately, in trying to find out information about the nobodies, who, again, there is fucking nothing on the internet about them whatsoever, I ended up going to the Queers page, and it turns out that uh, Joe Queer was uh, a bit racist when it came to the Black Lives Matter protest, oh, which I didn't know about. So that's, mm. a, that's, a, that's a bit of a shame. And that's where these people, they all... It's a bit... It's a, it's a lot like Ben Weasel. It's mm. like these people, they kind of played with these politics... In a kind of, oh, I'm just being funny and you're just being stupid and you're, yeah. you're easily offended. But then they've kind of, now they're obviously 50, 60 year old men. Yeah. Where are they in there? Where are, where are they at? And I think a lot of them are oh. not where, you, not where you'd like your heroes to be. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so next band on here is White Caps. Caps with a K. White Caps I don't really know very much about and I don't really like this song very much. It's from an album which Hopeless did put out called Cannonball Man, which I think is fairly fondly remembered. But White Caps are another band that there's not really any information about. No. They had obviously been going for quite a long time and they I don't know how influential they were. I mean, their sound is not a million miles away from the likes of Pennywise and that sort of stuff. Mm. And they were definitely doing it before them. But it definitely sounds like proper skate punk of the type, which I'm not really not, a fan of, no. particularly. Let's gloss over them then to the Bull Weevils, who are lovely. The Bull Weevils are lovely. They're also not really on Hopeless Records. Oh. Uh, this is from a seven inch, a split seven inch, which they did with Funeral Oration and oh. some other bands, which was like Chicago versus Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know why. They obviously just had, they all had extra songs, I suppose. <laughs> But the Bull Weevils are from Chicago. Uh, they released most of their stuff on Doctor Strange Records. And they are fucking brilliant. Yeah, this is a glorious song. I think that this might be their best song, to be honest. I mean, that's hard to say because they've got a lot of really good ones. They had a really long career. Their singer is a is a medical doctor. Oh. And I think always was, well, not always was, but was, you know, back in the day as well when he was younger. And they have got back together fairly recently. Oh. And they're gigging again, and they've actually released a new song, and possibly this year, Aww. their first in a while, which is fucking brilliant. It's called Liniment and Tonic, and I did message them on Facebook and ask them if we could play it on the podcast. Yes. I'm still awaiting a response. Oh, come on, Bull Weevil, sort it out. <laughs> but I would definitely say, listen to that song, it's great, but... Um, They are just a brilliant band, I think. Just a really brilliant band. There's a couple of proper albums, but the ones that I think are mostly remembered is there's two albums which are like the History of the Bowl Weevils, Volume 1 and Volume 2, and it's collections of all the stuff that they put out on 7 Inches and put out on compilation tracks and that sort of stuff. And both of those albums are just like, they've both got about 25, 30 songs on them, and they're just, there's not a bad one on them. Aww. They're fucking brilliant. Uh, Last but not least, a band... Real band? I don't know. A real band. A real band called Schlong. <laughs> uh, who do a. Is it Guys and. No, is it Guys and Dolls? No, it's no, West, Side, West Story. Side Story song. This one really has confused you from the start. It has. It, it, it really has. Like, I don't know why. So Schlong made one album. They did do a couple of other records later on, but this is like their one album, and it's just the whole of West Side Story, but made punk. <laughs> 
And not really very well. No. <laughs> but sort of alright. It's quite catchy. It's definitely another one. Well, it's a good song. So yeah. that's the thing. The guys, the, um, sorry, West Side Story version of it's pretty good as well. The album, I am, I don't think I've ever actually listened to the album in its entirety, but I've definitely dipped in and dipped out, very much dipped <laughs> out again. It's not really one that's going to be remembered particularly, but Schlong are interesting. Okay. And here is why. Say why. Uh, they're from Oakland. Cool. They did play Gilman quite a lot, and they were sort of a part of, I think they were almost like a party band in San Francisco, but the drummer is... Um, Dave Mello, who was the drummer from Operation Ivy. Oh, wonderful. And, by the way, maybe again. I, mean, I know, seem, I have heard about this. They seem to be rumblings. fucking around with the possibility. Yeah, so, I mean, he, he was, this was the only other band that he really did. Called Schlong. <laughs> Called Schlong. Doing West Side Story. Yeah. Beautiful stuff. Uh, there is a bonus track on here. It says Hidden and Unreleased, and good riddance to that. It is oh. um, We Go Together from Greece. And sung by various members of some of these bands, I guess. Well, no, I could never been able to work out who no, it is. is because uh, first of all and maybe this is a good time to bring this up we said this very same thing about punk mm-hmm. this is the only female voice on the entire exactly uh, album and i don't know who she is who, i don't know who it is I've, I've always presumed that it was probably just like the people that worked for hopeless records or mm-hmm. something singing it i would guess and it's what song is it it's um, we go together like we go together, la, 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 ding dong yeah I think it's quite beautiful, actually. Oh, well, I love this song full stop anyway. <laughs> What's the refrain at the end? We will always be together. Yeah. I mean, what a beautiful way to finish an album. That's how Greece finishes. Yeah, okay. It's a beautiful oh, thing. See, I didn't know As that. the car goes off into Greece. the sky uh-huh. and they've all had their end of school... Um, uh, uh, they've got rides and they've got cotton candy and all that stuff. And uh, they drive off into the sunset and all the people are singing and dancing, waving them goodbye. Oh, well, that makes much more sense. I thought they were just being clever. But yeah, I mean, it's it's dog shit production wise. <laughs> it's like the music, it could be the nobodies again. I don't know. The the music is just like barely that. You can hear drums yeah. and vocals pretty much. It's really badly mixed and stuff. And it's not played well. No. And it's not sung particularly well. No. But this one, I, now again, like at the time, it was definitely I skipped over it after a while. And of course, in 1996, the big thing that doing covers of mainstream songs in yeah. a punk style that was the thing the that everyone thing. did. Yeah. And um, the end of all of these, so we haven't actually mentioned this, I don't think. There's a bunch of these hopelessly devoted to you compilations, which we'll go through a little bit now. But at the end of each one of them, they covered a different song. Oh, in the okay. Style. I know one of them was Walk Like an Egyptian. But I don't know what the rest of them were. Oh, <laughs> well now I'm excited. I want to go and open them all up and uh, listen to them all. And that was Hopeless Records circa 1996. There you go. What did you think of this album? So you had never listened. You'd heard a lot of these bands, but did you ever listen to this album? No, I, I, these are all samplers that are a little before my time. Uh, and so this was my first listen to it. I knew some of the bands through you playing them, but I didn't know them from my own life. So Digger and Funeral Oration, beautiful. Uh, yeah, I liked it, generally. Oh, it was that's... All, <laughs> it was all good. Well, no, the thing is, I really liked it. Until I started thinking too much about that Nobody song, I quite liked pretty much all of it. I don't remember the White Cap song that well, and you said you didn't like it, so that's making me think that I didn't really like it that much. It I remember all the others. Noticed, yeah, really. that's the thing. I can name all, I can think of all these other songs... I quite like the 88 Fingers Louis song, actually, as well. I know one of them's the Misfits one, but their one I really like. But yeah, Funeral Oration, uh, just beautiful. And I can't believe that that song on here, the I Fall Harder song, was an unreleased that they just put on here, when it's so beautiful. I think I found that quite a lot. These Hopeless Samblers, and not just the Hopeless, I know all the Fat Wreck ones had this as well. Like, they always had loads of unreleased songs on them. And some, and often, so we'll, we'll move on to it now, but the Funeration unreleased song of the second Hopelessly Devoted yeah. to You is one of the best songs ever Which made. Which one is it? Unreal. Oh, it is gorgeous. And I think that, and I can never... Oh my never, God, that's I, such a good one. But it's not just them. Like, there's loads of people's songs. Un, the unreleased songs on these samplers are often, like, some of their one. better ones. Yeah. And I remember clearly, and this is weird, but I remember clearly, like, when you'd go to gigs in the late 90s... Whatever songs were on samplers were the ones that all of the audience knew. Oh, okay. So, like, the songs that people would go crazy for and sing along with and stuff were always the ones on the samplers. And, of course, that's probably because 
way more people heard them than actually bought yeah. these bands' albums. Yeah, maybe. And so I do wonder sometimes whether bands, and I've never found this out for sure, and I don't know how you would find this out for sure, but whether bands literally held back their best songs and put them on the samplers songs. as previously unreleased songs yeah, maybe. because they were going to be heard by so many more people. Maybe I guess it's not it's not the same at all now, so it's no, hard, yeah, to, it's hard to really compare it. There's no there's no comparison there, is there really. But yeah, so moving on, we'll just I mean just some of the bands that would then go on to uh, sign with Hopeless around about the same time. Against All Authority, who I've already brought up, who are really brilliant uh, sort of ska punk band, but much more like Krusty. Are they the ones that um, on that sampler you've got in your hand, uh, sampler two? They're the one that when they came down, I was just like, oh my god, like faintest idea. Yeah. Are like them incarnated now. Yeah, totally. Like, so good. It's exactly that. So style. good. I mean, I don't know if Faintest Idea, faintest idea were influenced by them. It's, well, I'd be kind of very like, surprised if they weren't. We've poo pooed Scar Punk quite a lot in, on this podcast, but th- that, against all authority, is exactly the correct. Well, this is punk. this is exactly what I, I think I mentioned this on a, either the last episode or on our Patreon episode. I, I surprised myself because two of the, my favourite things from all of Hopeless's early releases. Yeah. Is Fall in Sickness and Against All Authority, Scar both punk. of which are ska punk mm. bands. So, you know, work that one out. <laughs> probably most importantly, probably the most, in fact, no question whatsoever, the most important album that Hopeless Records ever put out was the first Dillinger 4 record. And they put out their first two albums. But the first one, the first one is never going to be forgotten. Like, it's definitely a bona fide punk classic, Best I think. I, I, I don't know if everyone would agree with that. It's not just... It's definitely to my tastes. It's one of the best punk albums ever made. But mm. also, I do think it's like, in historical terms, it's a very important album in the grand scheme of things. And so that came out after that. They signed Mustard Plug. That is some ska punk that I cannot get behind. <laughs> um, that you do still skip now, don't you? <laughs> yeah, definitely. They signed The Queers. And The Queers kind of pumped around. They had been on Lookout Records and then they presumably were offered more money, I would guess, and they moved to Hopeless Records. And they've kind of done a bunch of different uh, record labels since then. Uh, we've talked about the queers already. We don't need to again. There's a band called Heckle that were like a um, proper old-school hardcore band. Okay. They only really ever released one album. I have absolutely no idea who was in the band. It's not anybody who was in other bands or went up, as far as I'm aware, mm. went on to do anything else. But the first Heckle album, or the only Heckle album, is fucking brilliant. It's really good. And then following on from that, they just got better and better. They signed the Weaker Thans, oh, who again, like the Weaker Thans, released I think their first, voice. their first like two or three albums through Hopeless Records, and they're another one. They're never going to be forgotten. Mm-hmm. Like Left or Leaving is never going to not be a classic album. Uh, Sam I Am signed with them and released some of their later albums. Fucking brilliant. They released the only good album to come out in the year two thousand <laughs> with uh, Hopeless Records. Uh, Fifteen. Um, they that's Jeff Ott, who is kind of like a famous ish person from the East Bay who was in Crimpshine. And fifteen I never liked Crimpshine, I never really liked either, but I don't think you're supposed to say that because they're kind of like a classic band. <laughs> but I've never understood it whatsoever. It's kind of like weird muso punk with I a sort I mean, I of terrible even, um, vocals. I don't even know them. Very political. Okay. Uh, JJ Nobody and the Regulars was the guy from the Nobodies who he made like some sort of weird rock and roll band <laughs> uh, who didn't sing quite as dodgy words. He got over himself a time. But were way worse. Like, <laughs> musically, were just terrible. Stick to the incel shit. Uh, and then at Lo- Hopeless Records signed, are you ready for this? Okay. A band with two women in it. Selby Tigers. Unfortunately, Selby Tigers aren't very good. <laughs> oh. uh, but their first album is all right. It's not too bad. And I think that was kind of the end. I'm sure they did release a bunch more stuff, but that was kind of the end of Hopeless's glory period. Well, but they would not see it like that <laughs> at all. So moving back to their very, very, very humble description of their story, okay. which is just covered in, we are amazing. They go on to release Thrice's album, The Illusion of Safety, in 2002. I had that album. Mark, I've to that album. I bought that album because it was on Hopeless Records, and I got it home and I thought, what in the fuck have I done? <laughs> <laughs> so that sparks the, you know, the beginning of an era of Hopeless Records that they see as extraordinary, you know, the beginning of them being 
very 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 good um and it's probably marking the end of your interest in them full stop but that but can i just say as well that is definitely the era whereby they actually became a success yeah so you can totally from a business point of view they probably did everything right but from well, a, from a from a music point of view, they really shit the bed. Yeah, they really did. So it's the next period of their rise to prominence, as they describe it, and they name Thrice, Avenged Sevenfold, and the Weaker Thans as helping them get there. Um, Don't say the word "weaker thans" in the same sentence as those other fucking. They have. Pets. They fucking gone there. <laughs> um, and eventually, in two thousand and three, the glorious. I've never actually listened to this band, Avenged Sevenfold. Never listened to them, so I actually don't know what they sound like. But um, gives them their first gold record in 2005. And from then, I mean, obviously from 2002 with the Thrice album, but really from that Avenged Sevenfold album, Hopeless Records, you become an absolute dog shit. Uh, we are are we going to tag them in this? Yeah, why not? Okay, well, I'm, uh, you know... Don't... I don't think they're going to listen. It's going to no. take up a little bit of time. They've <laughs> but got they, bigger fish to fry. They, go, they, go down a different, they do go down a different route. And so, in our opinion, dog shit. <laughs> but, um, you know, they're making money, money, well, money now, so... I don't think that we necessarily... So we should, we should probably not go too far into their history because we really wanted to concentrate on this album. Yeah. But I think maybe let's jump forward. This is more or less what we did with Epitaph yeah. and the Punker Arm one. Should we go through some of their very new releases? Yeah, let's talk about their current artists on their roster. So we're going to kick off with a little boy called, I don't know, Noah Fince, Fince, Fink? Noah Fince? Noah Fince. No offense. No offense. Oh my oh god. Oh my god. I no, can I tell. This oh. is why he's a successful YouTuber, oh, I'd say. Did not get that. Fucking hell. So, well, th- this is it. So, that's interesting because you could not take any offense of this apart from how shit. You know, it's not offensive. I mean, I take great offense. I take offense it. because it's dreadful. So, <laughs> no offense, like you say, apparently was a YouTube star. Oh, if you Google him. Underneath his name, his job title is YouTuber. Right. I mean, that's fucking depressing. And uh, his music can only be described as busted light. <laughs> well, he, it's I like mean, he busted. would enjoy that. It's because... like busted without any, well, no, nothing. There was nothing good about busted. How can busted I describe hap- it? Put it this way. Busted happened at a time when it happened and we should have <laughs> all learned from that and never <laughs> repeated it but this boy has openly said he's influenced by busted and was busted crazy and has decided you know what i'm gonna fucking do it again and hope and, this, and hope now has a career signed him. yep and of course and everyone should know better and so he is an english person he is an englishman uh, i only know that because in his videos it goes to, uh, I mean, he goes, goes outside and he's obviously in England <laughs> yeah. and he's got a really annoying voice and oh. he says something, there's a bit of spoken word in the middle and it's fucking dreadful. Uh, this is just the worst music in the entire world I'm, I'm, because I'm always worried about becoming an old person that doesn't understand young people's music, right? I try and stay up with music and mm. I like a lot of new bands and what have you. Mm. And so I'm fairly confident that generally speaking, I'm not like... I'm not being an old fuddy-duddy that's like, oh, I don't like this newfangled music. Oh, the people these days. But the reason that I can be confident in the fact that I'm not that is because all of these bands on Hopeless, I'm not saying all music, full stop, but I do think pop music generally, sounds exactly the same, uh, like exactly the same, in every way, shape or form, as shit music... (laughs) From 20 to 25 years ago. Yep. Like, no different. So this boy sounds like, like Busted. Like Simple Plan and Busted and all yeah. of that sort of really or, bad. So many of them sound like Newfound Glory. Yeah. And the same thing happened with the Epitaph episode. There was that boy with the tattoo on his, the tattoos on his faces. Mm. On his faces. On his there faces. Was that, <laughs> there was that boy with the tattoo on his face who sounded like a pappy version of Newfound Glory. Yeah. Who were already a pappy version yeah. of something that was a pappy version of something else. One of the videos of one of the artists on here, I can't remember her name. Was it Scene Queen? Scene Queen. So there's a video of her like calling upon the like punk people of past, and she's looking at pictures of Avril Lavigne. Yeah. <laughs> and, and again, this sums up something about our culture because Avril Lavigne is making a comeback, and people are like, I say people. Some people that's seem not, to be quite happy about this. It's not my culture. And I'm just like, <laughs> not not my culture. <laughs> like, not my president, not my culture. <laughs> this is always dog shit, and I don't know why. 
we're now thinking it's long enough for this to be nostalgic and influential. But that's what all of this music seems to be doing. It seems to be looking back at this shittest era of music ever and going, let's be re-influenced by this shit and, and, and praise it. And there are people that are on board for this. This is why fucking Bowling for Soup are touring again and people are, in, are apparently happy about this. Avril Lavigne's about to come back and people are apparently okay with this. And now there's bands who were born at a time when they were becoming big going back and saying, I'm now influenced by these bands and I'm doing it again. And Hopeless are signing it. That's entirely Hopeless roster right now. But I think it's important to say that they're not influenced by these bands. Mm. I mean, they are. But they're not. it's not just as simple as being influenced. They are doing it exactly again. the same. So you could say, so if I go back to like my youth, right? Let's say, let's. I mean, not that this was my sort of music, but let's just say Green Day and Oasis, mm. right? They were both influenced by things of the past, mm. but they did their own. Even Oasis, who I'm not don't like very much, but like, they did their own sort of take on it. Yeah. And Green Day, they did their own sort of take on it, and they were actually being influenced by stuff that was around at the time that was more underground than them. Mm. More so than like Green Day were not, didn't sound like the Sex Pistols. They were definitely influenced by them. This stuff is not influenced. It's mimicking. It's mimicking. It's yeah. exactly that. And I suppose the other thing that, that I just want to say, which has confused me no end, and again, this isn't about all music, because this is just obviously Hopeless Records have decided that they release a very specific style of music. Mm. And it's obviously popular with somebody, although I cannot for the life of me work out who, but it obviously <laughs> is popular. But I worry that this is becoming old, but anyway. But no, but that, that, here's my point of being old. Yeah. In the past old people would have heard a new style of music and been like shocked by it yeah. and been like outraged by it or like, ugh, you know, this yeah. is this is unpleasant to listen to. <laughs> the reason I don't like this music is the opposite of that. It's because it's so, it's like safe music from 20 years ago. Yeah. You know? And done again. It, it's and like, didn't like it then. People didn't, pe- old people didn't look at the Sex Pistols and go, oh, you know, they're mimicking something else. They looked at the Sex Pistols and they were afraid of them because yeah. they were old people and they didn't understand what was going on. Yeah. And I'm not definitely not saying that in 2022 that doesn't exist. I mean, there's, unquestionably there is music which is being made that people would be like, oh, this is unpleasant yeah. because of, you know, whatever. This not is this. not it, no. you know? Like, this is like... Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, we were talking about like white boys singing about their feelings. This isn't all white boys, although it's mostly white people. Yeah. But, um, it's not all white boys, but you know, it's like so much worse than that. You know what I mean? It's like, really bad. it's so much worse than that. Anyhow, let's just go through them very quickly because we watched all of these videos, and so I feel like having put myself through that. You want to explain it a bit? Well, I don't even want to explain it. I just want to, you know, rag on them all. <laughs> Point North times Jerris Johnson. With their song Dark Days featuring Jerris Johnson. I mean, <laughs> Jerris Johnson's very keen to get his name on there twice. In the picture of the band, Jerris Johnson seems to be showing his tummy off. I'm oh, not really yeah. sure why. He, uh, I think he had his tummy out the entire video. Yeah, um, I'm not really sure why because it's not a great tummy. Um, well, no, he's skinny, but you know, good. Um, Point North sound like uh, Newfound Glory, but sort of pop, and mm. they're horseshit. Stand Atlantic is the next one. Is that the Paramore sounding one? Yeah, so well, I mean, they sound like a they sound like a (laughs) pappy version of Paramore. They make Paramore sound like a punk band. (sighs) Uh, Stand Atlantic. There's two songs that they've recently released. Both of their choruses start off with the word (laughs) "fuck" fuck because they obviously think that's extremely shocking. And so, and it's like they have that horrible shit thing that all songs do, where they build. There's a little verse where they're yeah. singing and then they come in with this big fuck. Yeah. Like it's really crazy that they're She's saying fuck. She's her hair out. Oh, my God. I mean, they, they're the band who whilst... And there's not just one, but they, they're one of the bands who whilst the band's set up is a drummer, a bass player, a guitarist and a oh, singer, yeah. there is about 50% of the song where no question whatsoever, or even though they're busy playing... There There is no guitar, there is no bass, and there is no real drums. It's a drum machine and, like, some sort of pappy keyboard. Yeah. It's very strange. Then there's Scene Queen with Pink Rover. There you go. I think I didn't like Scene Queen, and you were totally right about the fact that she, for some reason, is looking at pictures of Avril Lavigne in a (laughs) video. Calling upon her wisdom. But this song is a bit weird, at least. It is definitely not for me. Oh, gosh, no. It's (laughs) At least it's trying to do something. Yeah, 
but it's not a good thing. It's not a good uh, thing, but it's trying to do something. It's not enjoyable, uh, and, but it's, at least it's trying to do something. Scene Queen is the first of very many of these bands who chooses to write her name in a def, uh, black metal style, because yeah. that apparently is the thing that all of these fucking idiots are doing. <laughs> then next uh, is Remy. Remy is kind of like a rapper. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, song... we put the lyrics up in the video. <laughs> but the lyrics are dog shit. And I'm like, We're... why have you done a lyric video for... I like this girl, but she don't love me no more. That's exactly what it's like. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. I want to get a sandwich. <laughs> well, no, that's exactly what his yeah. lyrics are. But it's a lyric video. It's called Drunk at Dinner because he got so worried about going on a date that he got drunk at dinner. Oh, and now, gosh. And now I think he ends up with two women instead of one. I think and you I wanted think him to talk about his feelings. And there he is. And you're fucking... <laughs> Fucking Remy. Fucking Remy. Debbie Downer by Lolo and Maggie Linderman. Uh, Lolo pops up quite a lot. These seem to just be like pop girls who just sing pop music. Yeah. There's nothing punk about this. Then there's someone who I think is called Project. But he he spells his name P-R-X-J-E-K. That's in the heavy metal writing as well, I think. That is in the heavy metal Mm. writing. You're absolutely right. He names his song... Rather unassumingly, God of a different plane, <laughs> and is definitely singing about himself. Uh, Project appears to be a really slimy man with a ponytail oh! who is like sliming over girls. Is he the tech one? Yeah. The he, one that um, in his video up. he's like, oh my gosh, turn all the lights off in the city, and he does ex- it with his laptop. That's then. literally exactly what he does. Um, it, again, it's just like pop music, I yeah. suppose. It, so it is what it is, it's pop music. Illuminati Hotties with Sandwich Sharer. I which, always wanted to know who these people were because I heard the name. It, in comparison to everything else thus far, because there is one good thing left, but but it's all right. It starts horrendous, but then it is all right. Siobhan got quite upset because she saw Sandwich and thought, this is the song for me, then saw Sharer and thought, this is not the song, <laughs> this is not the song for me. Uh, but it's, it's kind of like indie rock but it is really overproduced again. And like this, you can hear that the song is all right, and but, I feel yeah. like the band is probably all right. They've chosen weird options for things to do in the song that makes it bad. Yeah. But better than some. Better than most. Better than Fame on Fire with their song Plastic Heart, which sounds, I am not even fucking kidding to you, 100% like they've bought that little shitty man from Linkin Park back from the dead <laughs> and they've made him sing a song. <laughs> Over the top of his friends in Linkin Park. <laughs> it is a Linkin Park song without anything taken away whatsoever, but just with some different boys miming to it. Oh, it is, is bad. fucking dreadful. And then we've got Grabbits with a Z with Teleport Come Down. That's just dance music. And then I think we start getting back into, yeah, then we've got, we're going back into No Offense. But the one good band that is left on Hopeless Records uh, is Tiger Jaw. Okay. Tiger Jaw are just like an indie punk band. No, not really an indie punk band. An indie band who are quite nice. Yeah. They're not the greatest band in the world. But compared to this lot. In comparison to everything, I don't know. Because by the looks of it, like all of these, they obviously have a thing where like a lot of these people from other bands like feature on in each other's videos. Okay. They've got a little community, I suppose. Hopeless community. And I don't know how Tiger Jaw could possibly deal with this <coughs> no offence prick or these Stand Atlantic ones who are constantly saying fuck at them. Fuck! Um, the last no offence song is called Worms. It's about how he's got worms in his heart. And it is the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen anybody <laughs> do with their life. And truly, truly hope that something horrible happens to this child's vocal cords. <laughs> <laughs> all this stuff on and I was just like making dinner and I walked through and I was just like is this a joke are, are all these bands jokes is yeah. this what music sounds like now fuck absolute fuck so very grateful for the DIY punk scene very grateful for any other music um, <laughs> yeah I think it is I can't important. believe that this is what previous like record labels that previously signed some like truly inspirational pop punk or punk bands now spend their time doing. And it's the same with Epitaph. And I don't know, it's probably the same for many other labels nowadays. I think Epitaph I just cannot had... believe this is where music, even the places that were meant to be alternative, now, you know, whatever. Do what you want, but what? I think that Epitaph had slightly more good stuff. 
So they had no, loads of this it. shit. They had loads of this shit. But no, but they were still releasing stuff. Some yeah. of it was old bands. So yeah. fine, they were releasing like Propagandy's new album. And that's not anything to write home about. But, you know, they did have some newer stuff that was all right. They yeah. released that uh, garden band, like Menzingers. I know they're not exactly new, but, you know, they're yeah, newer. They're doing that. But yeah, I have to say, my last thought on this entire debacle is that every single one of these horrible, shitty little children... <laughs> is dancing on Dillinger 4's grave. Cunts. And Dillinger 4 do occasionally play live, but, you know, it just feels like... Yeah, exactly what you said. It's like there's all of this amazing music and it has been completely tarnished by this dog shit. But, and, of course, the worst thing about this is this stuff must sell. Well, it probably doesn't sell records anymore because it's 2022, but Mm. this stuff is way more popular. These bands are all fucking playing stadiums. It's a shame that to Hopeless Records' ear or bank balance, something like this sampler means fuck all to them anymore and the bands that are currently bringing in the money are, like, so much more important to their bank balance that I want, like, I hope that they even think about these bands but for example on their artist page there's a couple of um they list their artists and they have a few that are alumni but they don't have all of them the only alumni they've written on there is like yellow card <laughs> and fucking um thrice yeah um and wonder years but wonder years is still signed but there's no mention like not a single one of the bands that are on the hopeless records or even there. not even gutter mouth who they actually started <laughs> yeah. the record company for feature on their artist page yeah. and you just think you know it's a bit of a fuck you to everything that they did that influenced so many people uh, that they can't be asked to think about them anymore because to be honest they have probably not earned money from any of those bands for so long and like you say some of those bands like Dillinger 4 are the bands that have influenced so many people and there's just no mention of it. It's like it never happened. I don't know whether they still have the rights to that album. Yeah, maybe. Albums. I think that possibly someone's re-released them. So, I mean, in which case, good. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah, maybe. I never thought that Fat Records would come through. But, you know, if Fat Records is now maintaining Dillinger 4's albums, yeah. that's, that's fine. I'd rather, yeah. I'd rather that, I think. Yeah. We should move on and play a song now. This song is from a band called Night Vision and the song is called Zookeeper. They're a band from France and their new LP, The After, is out now via Toxic What's It. It is beautiful looking. I should also say Toxic What's It Records currently are releasing punk albums, but, you know, 20 years' time, you wait. who knows what we might be... What teenagers will be releasing. We might be finding No Offences' uh, grandson... <laughs> And uh, putting that out. With whatever horrible rehashing of Paramore he's going to do in (laughs) 20 years' time. But Night Vision are brilliant, so this is them now with Zookeeper. This week's trashy movie for review is Vegas in Space from 1991. Swap their sex to go undercover as go-go girls from Earth. Thrilled to a 
Savage Meteor Shower. Behold, the Empress's off-world slumber party, the glittering soiree attracting queens and princesses from across the universe. Yes! But secret agents performing a traditional mid-20th century lounge act. These strange sights and more await on Vegas in Spain. Vegas in Space follows the futuristic fortunes of four male astronauts who, on a secret mission to the planet Clitoris, are ordered by the Empress of Earth to swallow gender reversal pills and thus change their sex, turning them into mid-20th century showgirls from Earth in order to infiltrate the glamorous Clitorian resort Vegas in Space. That was all one sentence. (laughs) A resort where all the men are forbidden to tread. Their mission to capture the politically proper, primped perpetrator of a heinous crime that has held the orbiting resort on a path of certain dominatrix. It's a race against time, evil and bourgeoisly trendy fashion for the girls, inverted commas, as they hurtle across the gal galaxy battling sordid fashion crimes. Christ. <laughs> I don't remember any of that actually happening in this film. The story isn't told in a way in which the viewer... <laughs> is allowed to appreciate it. <laughs> and that's how I can best describe this film. It definitely starts like, okay, I get the premise, and then I didn't understand it at all from about 20 minutes in. But did not mean that I did not enjoy it. Well, we have mild history with this film. Yes. So if it's not obvious from that description, a large percentage of the people in this film are drag queens. Yes, they are. And... For Siobhan's birthday, about five years ago, yeah, because she was enjoying RuPaul's Drag Race, I remembered this film. It was released on Troma, and I had seen it when I was a young man. A young'un. And I thought, oh, that would be nice. And so I bought her this as a gift, because I thought it would be very nice and thoughtful. Mm-hmm. And... It has never been watched. Mm -hmm. It has sat on our shelf like the telltale heart, beating away, saying how little Siobhan was interested in watching this film (laughs) I bought her five years ago, until we watched it for this. (laughs) That's the end of the story. Is there anything more to the story? Oh, well, I did really enjoy it. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, no, I mean, to look at it, you know it's going to be difficult to watch uh, production-wise. Yeah. I think that's fair to say, and fair to say now that we've watched it. Uh, it's incredibly low budget. It's extra- but it took eight years to make. Eight years to make the budget. Um, Someone, one of the drag queens, the one who directed or wrote it, or, I mean, I think all the people that are acting in it pretty much wrote and directed it as well. Yeah. Um, Doris Fish, who is the main character. Um, during production, Doris was making a good living as a cool boy and funding for the film came for their earnings. Doris once said, who said you couldn't make a film on a prostitute's salary? <laughs> um, so there we go. It was made by people based in San Francisco and there was some vague uh, connection to the punk scene. Someone called Jennifer Blowdryer, who was from the band The Blowdryers. Oh, OK. A very, very early San Franciscan uh, punk band is in this I'll be honest. I mean, it's quite difficult to work out the difference between a lot of the people in it, just uh-huh. because, partly because the quality, I think, yeah. but also because everyone's made up to such an extreme yeah. extent. I mean, it's to describe uh, everybody as drag queens, I think underplays it. You'd probably be able to comment on this more than me, but I feel like it's more. It's almost more than drag. Yeah, like they're painted bright colours and obviously there is drag makeup yeah but as well as that there's also an awful lot well they're also like aliens and yeah yeah, they've got lots of like some of them are green some of them are blue what i would say is so i'm a big rupaul drag race uh fan uh watched too much of it and many people have by now uh because it's been going for about 14 15 seasons they always have this challenge which is acting challenges in it and they're always these really poorly acted scenes from like either over the top 80s film or like space film. So they've done things very like Vegas in space. And I can't like watching it on RuPaul. I've always been like, God, this is just terrible, silly, underacted, overacted ridiculousness with stupid outfits on that I really enjoy watching. I cannot believe how much this film is exactly that 
But except on RuPaul's Drag Race, it's like five minutes. And on this, it was a full film's worth of, <laughs> of like poorly acted, as if they've never... And I think it's probably fair to say, have never acted before or since. I think to call these people non-actors is kind of like calling a cat a non-dog. It's like these people don't even know what an actor is. It's like, I mean, again, we're going back over the same stuff. It's like It's like they didn't know what a film was or what an actor was yeah, or what a script was and they were just told to go and do something. Start saying some words. Because there's points where, I mean, they're li- again, it's like they've forgotten how to talk. They say lines that they've obviously just been told to, rem- you know, they've been like given to remember and they say them without like any humanity. <laughs> you know, it's like they've never said words before. They're just repeating the words that have just been fed to them. Yeah, but it's yeah. like they're just sounds. Like maybe they don't speak English or something, and they've just learned it phonetically. <laughs> I, and they obviously haven't. I don't mean that in a. Yeah. I'm not being, but like, I suppose maybe they are trying to be bad. <laughs> no, but it's like without really putting some effort into being this bad at acting. See, I so again having watched too much RuPaul's Drag Race, it is exactly like the acting challenges in there where they don't know how to act. I feel like the the RuPaul's um, challenges are mimicking this sort of thing. And I feel like it's all very deliberate now. Mm. And I kind of feel like there is a... And then looking back at this film, I feel like I quite enjoy it because it reminds me of the silly the silly challenges and the silly like non-acting. And I find it all quite endearing and I can quite get behind it. But, I mean, I've looked at a lot of the reviews for this film and they're just like, Jesus Christ why aren't these people acting? Yeah. Um, and I completely can understand I mean, that, if you watch this without not. any context, it would blow... As I did, by the way. So yeah. as a teenager, I watched this because it was on Troma and it ended up being on the telly. There was, I think it was on like Channel 4 <laughs> late at night or something. There was like a Troma season. And it's definitely... I've told this almost this exact same story before about Rabid Grannies. Yeah. Which we reviewed on this ago. podcast ages ago. And it would have been in the same series as that. So I watched Rabid Grannies and thought, oh, okay, this is w- really weird horror made in Romania. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, next week they've got one called Vegas in Space. That's probably going to be the same sort of thing. And then I put it on. <laughs> and I didn't even know... You know, I was, st- I was probably only about 15 or something. Yeah. I was literally like, is that a man? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? What's like, going on? Yeah. So I was not ready for this. I'm really. It probably affected me in some sort of positive way yeah. in the long term, but at the time I was definitely not ready for it <laughs> at all. <laughs> so I can imagine somebody just putting this on. If this was on like Netflix or something, and someone was just like, oh, "I wonder what Vegas in Space is like." I quite like sci-fi, and they put this on, they'd just be like, "What the fuck." I do love it though. Yeah, it's like proper, like you know, the spaceship goes left and they all go woo and teeter over to the left, like quite dramatically, but in a shit way. The special effects in this film are beautiful. <laughs> there's one bit where a robot kind of splits open and there's like meant to be blood pouring out of them, and you can literally see the straws where the people are obviously someone on the other end is just blowing air through it, yeah. um, just to get a bit of well, the special out- effects. The outside because it's obviously all filmed on a set and. The outside scenes are literally just toys. Yeah, being thrown. (laughs) Being thrown or like on a string or... They're so bad. But I will say this, a couple of things, and this is probably true of a lot of of the like set design and stuff. Yeah. It's all just shit. Like it's just shit that someone's bought presumably from a thrift store Uh, or something. Literally, the commercial display store, they literally just found the weird sets already made and just positioned it in front of a camera. Yeah, but like... They're cool toys. Yeah. Like, they're all obviously from the 50s or something. Yeah. So, so even the, like, terrible special effects where it's like, here's a spaceship flying into Vegas, and Vegas yeah. is literally just these, like, toy things. Yeah. Some of them aren't even buildings, really. They're just things. Slumps. But they're really cool. Like, the actual yeah. things themselves are really cool, like, toys. They are cool. I like that also, so I've just got um, IMDb facts up. Most of the film was shot in Doris and Ginger's flat, 422 Oak Street, San Francisco. <laughs> and nice. you noticed it. You were like, look at the tarpaulin. And they're just like, you can see the tops of boards. So it's meant to be a wall, but you can see where the wall ends. Yeah. It's just like 
a board covered in a sheet about as tall as the people in the in the shop. Yeah, it's like with they, tarpaulin in the back. Yeah, they put the camera in the wrong place so you can see like off the side of the set <laughs> yeah. and stuff. But then the but the weird thing about that is that there is aspects of this which must have cost money. Yeah. So the outfits are fucking fabulous. Yeah, they are. And obviously, I presume like a lot of these people probably had their own outfits, and that's why. Mm. But like the makeup, which must have been very specifically done for this film, and like some of the just some of the stuff like there's like carpeted walls in certain scenes that are really weird yeah and like they've obviously made sets but they've just not made sets that are quite big enough so like you say like you've got this quite beautiful incredible looking set with just a bit of tarpaulin next to it and you can sort of see you can see people walking around behind the tarpaulin and stuff or like there's obviously just a, a light switch or something <laughs> that just off shot but it's not off shot because they've accidentally not put the camera <laughs> they put the camera where you can clearly see I love it though I think that's test- like I, I feel like drag queens there's not a lot of money in drag I mean this person yeah, there is thing. now there is now only if you're like yeah if you're if you're one of those famous ones but these guys were like I mean one of them paying for it through like prostituting themselves out oh yeah, yeah, yeah and i feel like drag queens are notoriously thrifty and make all their own things and do all that so i quite like the like cobbled together aspect of this film kind of knowing that they they wanted to make a film for whatever reason they got it all together the two or three of them wrote everything raised the money for it and they did it and I quite like the kind of DIY nonsense oh, of this film. Yeah, yeah. And two of the main people died this the, the year that it came out. Yeah. So I'm glad that it happened and, and they got to do it. And they will never be forgotten. It's a bit like Dillinger Four's first album, this uh, <laughs> Vegas in Space from 1991. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Troma that. have got the rights for it. It's on YouTube, so it will always be there It'll forever. It'll always be there. <laughs> Is it on YouTube? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. YouTube playlist, guys. As always, watch Vegas in Space. So aside from what we've already mentioned about our glowing reviews of this film thus far, any favourite standout bits of the film you want to comment on? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, there's loads of really crappy dialogue yeah. that is very charming. And there's lots of like puns. It reminded me a little bit of Flesh Gordon that we watched yeah. for our 1974 episode. Very nice. Um, the spaceship that they're on is called the SS Intercourse. <laughs> you know, of that's, course. That's enough to make me laugh. The planet Clitoris is in the Beaver Galaxy. Yeah. That made me laugh. Um, and when they said, when they they would, so the, the start of this, they're all dudes. Dudes. Except two of them are dudes and two of them are ladies, but they're playing dudes. Yeah. And then they have a sex change and then the, it, it yeah. goes the other way. Um, but they, they kind of try, they're obviously all quite camp people. Yeah. And they kind of try and play like bros. And that's quite cool. And I don't know why it really made me laugh. When they said that they've got to go to Planet Clitoris, one of them turns around and goes, dudes can't go there. Yeah. And it just, but in a really not like I've just done it, like in just a way that no one could, no one could have done apart from the person who said it. Um, <laughs> well, there's another line around that same time um, where they get told they have to change sex. Yeah. But we only have dude clothes. <laughs> yeah. We've only got dude clothes. <laughs> uh, one of them's called Dick. And Dick considers himself such a man that when they have to take pills to change sex, he asks for two of the sex change <laughs> pills. And as a result, he just vanishes. He's not in the film ever again. <laughs> no, no. But his name is Lieutenant Dick Hunter, which oh. is, again, enough to, um, you know, amuse me. Yeah. The colours in this film, a lot of which come from those, like, fabulous outfits, are just mm. brilliant. There's so many, like, it's so neon and like everybody's just got so much like face paint and their and like body paint and yeah. then their outfits are like crazy they've got a lot of them have got this weird thing going on where they've got massive triangular yeah um kind of neck lines which are hard to describe but are really fabulous i think like, it's like typical 60s 50s sci-fi outfit yeah but like turned thing. up to 111 like the jetsons yeah oh, well i feel like I, I i get just from i mean my knowledge of drag is almost all just rupaul drag race so it is limited but there's a lot of like 50s sci-fi influence in a lot of like drag so mm. i guess this is probably quite usual uh but it is really fascinating and fab to look at there's one point in the film where somebody turns the color off in the world oh yeah and they just and it's out of nowhere there's no reason for it 
uh, they just find this big button and she says, look, I can turn the colour off. And clearly the reason they did that was because they only had enough colour film stock to do some of the film. And, they, <laughs> and so they had some black and white left over. And so there's a whole chunk of the film which is in black and white for absolutely <laughs> no reason whatsoever. And then they just turn the colour back on. There you go. Uh, so that I really like that. Every now and again, they sort of break the fourth wall a little bit. Like there's one bit where someone says, this kind of looks like a movie set. And I sort of thought, I know that you're trying to be clever, but it doesn't look like a movie set. It looks like it looks like you're flat, and I can see <laughs> the tarpaulin. So, I mean, that joke doesn't really work. Someone, you know, so like they refer to things like something stupid will happen. Someone says it's just a bad dream sequence, like just to sort of write it off as being bad. I kind of like that. You know, the soundtrack is fucking crazy. It's beautiful. There's some cool songs in it. Uh, it starts with this song, which is the Vegas and Space theme tune, which I wouldn't describe as a good song, but it has a lot of charm. Yeah. But there's a couple of songs, which I can't really describe that well, that are just in the background. One of them is kind of like, it sounds like a nursery rhyme, but over the top of it, it's just someone screaming. <laughs> and then in the next scene, it kind of starts off with some like really lo-fi synth pop, which sounds fucking great, sounds mm. really cool. And then after about 10 seconds of the synth pop the screaming starts again and it's just like is that the vocals or what and like they're all they all seem to be done by the same band and i feel like maybe it was a band who had a singer that just screamed well, over I, the top of whatever they did i think that the music was all made by two of the people in the film the yeah, dick well, hunter guy who disappears he's called teddy prince or something i can't remember his name now. <laughs> of course he's called teddy prince. Um, he's such a dude he's yeah, so much a... i need two pills <laughs> Um, it's him and uh, maybe even Doris Fish or there's Miss X in here. There's a couple of people that it's um, that do all the singing and all of the music. Yeah, I mean, every, I feel like everything is done by the same Very much an in-house production. Ginger Quest, who is one of the actors in this, uh, at the very beginning of the film, it says based on... You know how a film might say, like, based on a story by oh, Stephen yeah. King? It says based on a party by Ginger Quest. <laughs> yeah. I, thought, I just think that's the greatest way of starting a film possibly ever. I can't yeah. think of any better way. And it ends with a beautiful line. Somebody says, don't stop dancing. That's how you can best save the universe. Aww. And I don't know how deliberately they were. I think it probably was deliberate that they were being that beautifully poetic. I think that's a lovely line. Aww. And I think that all films should finish with that line. Definitely. <laughs> Um, well, that's a beautiful thing. But yeah, I really liked it. Um, I would say that how different drag, the drag scene was in 1991 compared to the squeaky clean, mm. corporatized bullshit that mm-hmm. makes up RuPaul's Drag Race sort of reminds me a little bit of what Hopeless Records have done in a way. Yeah, that's you true. Know? This is literally like, this is the Dillinger 4 of drag. This and is the Dillinger 4 of RuPaul drag. RuPaul is the... I can't even remember. No those, offense. No offense. <laughs> version of drag. Maybe. And I think it's sad because I think that the world has almost everything you could probably follow that trajectory for. Like music, you can definitely follow that trajectory for. I, and yeah. drag. I know that obviously there is still independent drag going on unquestionably, but independent drag, you're going to disagree with me on this. Yeah. I am not an expert, but what I've seen and what I'm aware of independent drag in 2022 is influenced by RuPaul's Drag Race. This stuff was not. This was something completely different. And I remember we watched the documentary about the 70s drag scene in in New York. And that was exactly the same. It was a completely different thing. What I would say about RuPaul that uh, is good and that Hopeless Records doesn't do, and we kind of alluded to it, is RuPaul at least talks about the past and and seeks for people to look back at it and so some people who are getting into drag now via RuPaul are being directed to the past um yeah. whereas no one in Hopeless Records is saying look back apart from no offense saying look at Busted <laughs> like <laughs> no one's looking back at the 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 past too too directly I know a lot of people in the RuPaul kind of world aren't necessarily doing that but the direction is there for people to follow should they wish to. I suppose and there is a lot of, you know, through the challenges that I mentioned, they do talk about things like Vegas in space and Divine gets brought up and John Waters brought up and Paris is burning. The only reason I know of it is because of RuPaul. So there yeah. is a lot of trying to direct people to the history and they talk about the history of it very importantly, whereas Hopeless Records don't even bat an eyelid at it anymore. 
But I do sort of think that there's there's another there's another way of looking at that, which is that you've taken something that was brilliant, you've mm. corporatized it, and then you said, but don't forget to go back and look at the stuff beforehand. Yeah, it's like well, yeah. you should just not have been there. Like RuPaul was was a part of this scene. I yeah. remember RuPaul in the nineties being the most famous drag queen yeah. in the world, but not in the way that not what not like what now. you know the drag race has sort of become. So in that context, that's fine. That's all well and good. But it's like, I'm sure Busted probably said we really like Green Day. But Busted should have just shut the fuck up and either been a good band or not been a band. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's like to, to do something, to ruin something, to corporatise something, which to me mm. is ruining it. And you can, there's, I'm sure there's definitely arguments about that. But to corporatise something and therefore ruin it, you've done the damage. It's not really that much good. So all of those people that are coming in and being told, oh, you should watch Paris is Burning, they're still coming into it with this new version. They're not... That thing's not really going to influence them in the same way as if they had discovered drag. And then... Because the internet exists. Yeah. Paris is Burning is easy to find. I mean, it was on Netflix. I think we watched yeah. it on Netflix. It's not difficult to find. I think the good thing about things like RuPaul... Sorry, this has just gone way off topic from Vegas in Space. So this is my last comment on it. The one good thing about RuPaul is, yes, it's made it mainstream. Yes, it's made it corporate. But there are now drag queens that were earning no money that now the wider world is interested in drag and their shows are busier than they were before. They're still not... But you're describing capitalism. You're describing corporatization or something. Why yeah. is that good? Because these but people are like earning money now. But that's now like they saying, are. oh, it was, it's so much better now. The DIY punk scene, like, we have to pay £10 a ticket, whereas before you were only paying <sighs> yeah, £5. Yeah, no, I ticket. know. I, oh, I don't Why know. Why is that a good thing? Why is money the only thing to base anything on? The reason this is beautiful is because there was no money. Yeah, no, true, true, The true, reason true. why these people are incredible is because they had no money. Yeah. Things, like, having money is not a necessarily a good thing it's not necessarily a bad thing either but it's i know i'm just thinking of people that really do i don't know i don't know maybe i'm getting too into the the sob stories that turn up on rupaul's drag race so oh but that's a whole nother but that's a whole nother that's that's turning it into the modern world that's that's saying oh i tell you what that um pop idol did really good didn't it because they were all given (laughs) pop like they all gave sob stories so how we get we could make the most of this when we yeah. make our reality tv show yeah you know it's the it's the way of the modern world but vegas in space is good but vegas in space is very good <laughs> so what would you give it out of 10 um it's beautiful to look at i really enjoyed it i can't say i understood a second of what was going on the story um, was not important the story <laughs> doesn't really feature but I absolutely loved watching everyone in it and all of their cruddy performances, uh, which I found really endearing because just knowing that it was people poncing about in someone's flat <laughs> um, just makes it really fucking cool. Um, I'd probably go as far as about a s- seven out of ten. From a filmmaking perspective, it's a zero. From yeah. A, from a sort of any kind of skill perspective, it's a zero yeah. pretty much. Uh, it's definitely not for everybody. I think that, some, again, it's similar to Flesh Gordon in as much as I think if you put this on and a minute in you thought, I don't think I like this, you're not going to like it. Yeah, you're like, going to hate you it. Know, like, there's no, there's no way. It doesn't get better. <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, I'm going to give it a six. Yeah. And now we're going to play an old song. Whoop, whoop. This song isn't that old. Oh. I keep doing <laughs> this recently. This one's from 2012. These were all 90s. See, I told you, I'm very up to date with music. So modern. I don't know much about this band either. I just fucking love this song. This band is called Ocume. They were from New England. They released one EP, which was called Brave Lit Labacus. It came out on quote unquote records. I don't know anything about them. From what I can make out, this EP came out after they'd split up and they'd just recorded like four songs. And so someone put them out. And I don't even know how I stumbled across it. Yeah, I was about to say, how'd you find this? But I did. Oh. And I'm glad that I did. And I fucking love it. And this song particularly, but all four songs are brilliant. You can download it for free, I think, if you go to quote unquote still. I think it's still up online. And I would very much recommend it. Yeah. So this is Okime and it's called For Colin.
choking on my words, trying to sing yours. So that's everything from the Breakfast Punks podcast this episode. Whoop, whoop. Thank you so much for listening, as ever. Uh, we have things that I need to tell you about, which I'm going to now try to remember. Follow us on Instagram <laughs> at Breakfast Punks Podcast. Sign up to our YouTube channel at Breakfast Punks Podcast. Sign up to our Patreon at Breakfast Punks Podcast. <laughs> and if you give us more than £3 a month, then you'll get another episode of Breakfast Punks Podcast. Extra ball. Whoop as, whoop. as always, uh, I will put a, make to a YouTube playlist with all of the cool stuff, including all of these good hopeless bands and probably none of the bad ones. But if you want to watch any of the bad ones and see what we were talking about, you can just go to the Hopeless Records uh, page. It's all of their main videos. And they are terrible. Oh, fucking dog shit. As always, you can email us at shamcityroasters at gmail.com. No one ever emails us. Aww. So, you know, you can do that. You can always... People do message us on yeah, Instagram. Yeah, we get messages. We get messages. So you can always... I mean, you know, if it's not through social media, did it happen? Mm, so maybe it's that's, why, the that's why we're not getting any emails. Uh, but message us on uh, Instagram if you've got anything you would like to say. Yeah. And this podcast comes out every two weeks on a Thursday. You listen to it. We make it. <laughs> We enjoy ourselves. We've done 33 of the fucking things. Jesus Christ. What are we doing? <laughs> I know what we're doing. We're playing one last song and then we're getting out of here. It's a very brief banger. Too. Brief banger. The brief banger of the month. Yep. I'm just saying that now. <laughs> uh, so this last song is from Chinese Junk and the song is called Ghost Town. It's from the new EP Raw Deal out on cassette via Big Neck Records. We love Chinese Junk, but nothing whoop whoop. whoop, whoop. Um, so yeah, we're going to end with that and we'll see you in two weeks time. Goodbye now. Goodbye. What the fuck?